Hello, and welcome back to Sociology 101. We're going to continue where we left off uh, responding to Apologia Studios with Jeff Durbin and his friends talking about Romans chapter 9. It was a lot longer video than I expected it to be, and our response is, it, uh, as we've mentioned before, it takes a while sometimes to unpack some of these doctrines and respond to these issues, especially when I'm uh, looking at the side chat and responding to your questions and your comments as well. Before we jump into this, let me remind you, this is a listener-supported ministry, so if you can give to support Sociology 101 and help us spread the news of God's love and provision, we would greatly appreciate it. It also helps when you like and share this video and subscribe and download the app if you would like to keep up with all the content that's coming out from Sociology 101. Um, we also want to, to remind you that if you would like to get a higher theological education, consider Trinity Seminary. You can find more information there at Sociology 101. Dot com. Click on the classroom link and uh, you can learn more about how you can be a part of Trinity Seminary. And so let's jump in here before we get into the video from uh, Jeff Durbin uh, in Apologia Studios. I wanted to respond to, to a few things from, uh, well, also a part of Apologia uh, Church is, um, is James White. And uh, he and I had some Twitter exchanges over the last couple of days. And I wanted to present this because I want to get some of your feedback even on this particular issue because it really does uh, kind of baffle me sometimes the way in which people respond to criticisms um, or critiques, even if the argument is is meant well. One of the, the most popular arguments that I hear from Calvinists is um, the concept and idea they'll ask the question, what, what, you know, what makes you better? Um, or do you think you're better because you believed in God and somebody else didn't? Matter of fact, even in this video that Apologia Studio uh, is is going to, they're even going to present this as one of the big arguments. Okay, what 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 it, what makes you better that you believed in Jesus and your friend didn't? That's a, one of the biggest questions. And we have in a, in my book, The Potter's Promise, it's an appendix that I actually have this. It's online as well on a blog article. You could find it if you just search that there at Sociology 101. So we've answered this question obviously many times before. Um, and uh, and so when you ask that question though, what are you assuming? You're assuming, hey, you guys must think you're better if you believe the gospel and someone else doesn't. But the truth is we don't think you're required to be better to believe the gospel. We believe anyone could believe the gospel. You could be of a really bad moral character, have a horrible moral character, and you can still believe the gospel. You can recognize your sinfulness in light of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God into salvation. It brings truth. Truth can set you free. If you suppress the truth, that's your own fault. But if you believe the truth, you accept the truth, no matter what moral character you have, no matter how bad you've been in your past, no matter what uh, sins you've per, you know committed over your life, no one is beyond the reach of the gospel. And so anyone of any moral character depth, you may have lived a really moral life all your life, or you may have been a, a hooligan that, <laughs> hooligan, that makes me sound old, doesn't it? You, you may, <laughs> those hooligans, get them off my lawn, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, so you may be horrible all your life, you know, the worst of sinners. And, and still God's grace can cover you and anyone can believe the gospel on our view. That, that's a provisionist view. Anyone can believe the gospel. So you don't believe somebody has to be morally better to believe the gospel. Okay. Um, and, and, and it's, it's, it's somewhat of a, a projection on, on the Calvinist part because they're the only ones who believe you have to be better in order to believe the gospel. And this is a point I made in a Twitter uh, comment. And and this is what, what I put. I'll, I'll let you read it for yourself. I said, Calvinists assume that one must be better in order to believe in Christ. So that's why they affirm pre-faith regeneration, which changes a lost person into someone better, someone with a new heart, right? And then they project their assumption on us by asking what made you better? Since, since you don't, guys don't have regeneration, pre-faith regeneration, what is it that makes you a better human being? Um, because on our view, Calvinist would say, our view, God is what makes us a better human being, i.e. through regeneration, where we were once morally unable to respond. That's Jonathan Edwards' word, by the way. Piper uses that terminology. You're, you have moral inability. Well, what is moral inability? That means you're not morally superior. You're morally inferior. So you're born morally inferior unless you're regenerated, which gives you a new heart, gives you eyes to see, gives you the ability morally to do something you were born unable to do by God's decree too. Mind you, you can't ignore that fact. God decreed for you to be in this condition. So it's not within your control. 
And so you can't respond morally because of your moral condition from birth is so corrupt and so bad. You are so morally depraved. You can't respond. You can't want to respond positively on Calvinism. So they have to be made into a better human being by regeneration. That's why regeneration precedes faith on Calvinism. Well, that's not our assumption. We, we don't come with that a priori assumption like the Calvinist does. And so the Calvinist assumes that you have to be better in order to believe the gospel. Um, and we don't. And so when they ask the question, what made you better so that you would believe, they're question begging by assuming a person must be better in order to believe. When the truth is that God created us in such a way that anyone can put their trust in Christ for salvation. You don't need to be turned into a better person in order to believe in Jesus. You come to Jesus in order to be turned into a better person by him, that's sanctification. So you turn to Jesus in order to be made better on provisionism. You're not a better person by a unilateral work of supernatural grace causing you to be a better morally better person with moral ability, and then you'll believe. Anyone, in our view, can come to him for salvation. Um, I have a surprise for you. You will not believe who just jumped on. There he is, Warren Hello. McGrew. Hey. <laughs> I texted him literally like what what three minutes ago three, and said, three "Hey, minutes ago. Yeah. hey, you want to jump on? Go ahead. You, you want to?" I'm here. And I didn't man. even I'm know here. I was going to do this. I honestly didn't even know I was going to do this video until 17 minutes ago, probably. And so I, I had some time open up, and so I decided to jump on here. And I saw you make a comment about me looking like I had a Moses glow and the the thumbnail. That's because I threw this thumbnail together in five minutes, as you can tell, it's it's a very, uh, it's not Caleb material. Uh, Caleb will fix it up and make it the, the thumbnail look more professional later. But I, I had some mom a moment, so I decided to jump on. And Warren, thanks for jumping on with me. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. No, you you did. You had that that Moses off Sinai glow in that thumbnail. You were just like all white. I didn't honestly. I it did was the first picture in my phone that I could find that you know that had just a picture of me that I could take the background out of, and I, I popped it on there. It's it's goofy, but uh, I did not, it, I Caleb's going to laugh at you. me. I, I was looking for the, the 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 Ten Commandments on the two tablets. I was like, <laughs> is this about Moses? And then I was like, that's Leighton. I was like, okay. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay, fun stuff. I, and I, I do see the side I chat. I was listening behind this, this, the stage before you brought me on. And yeah, I just yeah. wanted to say, uh, yeah, I, I agreed with everything that I heard. <laughs> well, and that, that's the thing is, I, I, what am I missing here? Because, well, let's look at, let's look at um, James White's reply to this post. Okay, so I, I post this. I just explained what I believed. So let's, here's what um, James White, well, Whitebeard there, uh, here's his reply to it. And so you can give me your feedback as well, uh, Warren, as to um, what what you think he's thinking when he says this. First, he starts off with, of course, the ad hominem coming at me personally. Uh, he says, I have to keep reminding myself that the author of these tweets makes serious pretense to having once been reformed himself. It's hard because one could at least understand someone who has never even read 10 pages of reform presentation, completely missing the main issues and misrepresenting them. But this is just a regular everyday event with Leighton Flowers. The Bible teaches that men are dead in sin and in love with their evil. Okay, stop there. First, um, I've demonstrated through broadcast of me preaching back when I was a Calvinist. I've had Brad and several other guy, people that I helped to win into Calvinism, <laughs> that I was a Calvinist with, back converting other people into Calvinism, uh, back for the 10 years that I was a Calvinist. So I, I may not have been exactly the same kind of Calvinist White was. I, for example, I wasn't you know really rude to people, even when I was a Calvinist. <laughs> and so uh, I was different than James White is as a Calvinist, but I, I did affirm the tulip systematic, as you did, Warren. Um, yep. And I, I know that he would deny you probably were ever a Calvinist either. But nevertheless, that has nothing to do with it. This is ad hominem. The reason, anytime you, you, you want to point out ad hominem, you just ask, you just say back, okay, pretend somebody better said it. P pretend R.C. Sproul came back from the dead and said the exact same thing. How then would you answer this argument? Um, instead of just assuming that the person uh, is lying or somehow uh, trying to uh, misinform people. Um, and, and also, he claimed to once be an Arminian. So... I'd have to say, why Why does he continue to make arguments against Arminianism that have been answered millions of times by Arminian scholars if he's, was already Arminian? He was, a, he was an Arminian. He should already know those answers. 
Could it be that he disagrees with Arminianism now? And that would be the reason that he continues to make arguments against Arminianism because he doesn't agree with it anymore. So the, the fact that you can leave a system and then question it doesn't mean you don't necessarily know what possible answers your opponent may give. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure I could probably guess what most Calvinists would say in response to every one of the arguments I've made. They're varied. They're not monolithic. They're different kinds of Calvinists that give different kinds of answers to the, the various questions that I ask, um, all of which I'm not convinced by, obviously, or I would be a Calvinist. But but this concept and idea that, oh, you can't be, this is the no true Scotsman fallacy, isn't that right, Warren? Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yes. Um, where it's it's a fallacious argument. It's an ad hominem. It's it's casting shade upon the the individual who claimed to once be something that he's not now instead of just addressing the argument as a, a good faith interlocutor would do. And so that you just kind of mark that off as that's just something white does that we have to deal with sometimes. Okay. It, it, it's not a, it's not a consistent line of criticism either, because you could take the same attack and go, well, atheists that have converted to Christianity were never really atheists. Otherwise they wouldn't be criticizing that view. It's like, well, right. hold, hold up. You know, you, you can, you can hold a view you can get new un understanding, new insight into it. You can um, come to understand it, it from a different perspective and go, I understand the answers that I once had. And I now find those very same answers unsatisfactory in light of everything else that I now know. It doesn't mean that you didn't once affirm that view. And uh, it's it's really, it, it, it half the tweet is unnecessary. It, it's it's yeah. just, it's what it is. It's addressing something that he sees as easy rather than the actual point of contention. And, um, you know, I, I, I personally, just a confession, I'm going to try and do less Twitter because <laughs> I don't handle this sort of stuff well. And I need to seek yeah. out some sort of counseling for <laughs> helping me, uh, step away from the tweets because, um, I, I, Twitter's I you, probably I, the I'm worst of all of the, it's, it's probably the worst of all the social media because a lot of times it's limited in its text, unless you've got the super, you know, the super, whatever feature blue check mark, whatever it is. Um, you, so you're limited in the number of, of characters. You, you really can't see the first person's face, but like on Facebook, at least you can see their page. They've got a wife and kids. And so you may see them as a real human being, at least more so on it's Facebook easier. than you do it's easier, on Twitter. But you still, you still get those keyboard warriors that are, yeah, Treating you completely different bad. than if we were sipping coffee in Sunday school well, together. Especially if the person you're engaging with has like two followers and they started on Twitter three days ago. And so you know it's somebody you've probably blocked already because of their vitriol. And and they don't have their real name. They have some avatar up there with a fake name. Um, and and they're and they're just throwing stuff at you. Um, apologetic, uh, unapologetic apologetics. Thank you for your super chat. Sorry covering you there. <laughs> um, Augustine said, uh, in the two cities and since no one is evil by nature, but whoever is evil is evil by vice. Why do Calvinists reject Augustine? Well, it, it w well, we would point out, of course, Augustine did argue for free will and against the Manichaeans, uh, for the first, what, 15 years of, uh, after converting. And so, uh, as, as Ken Wilson points out, he actually has really good arguments for free will. And matter of fact, go listen to my, uh, video where I, I read verbatim through the debate between Augustine and Fortunatus because Augustine debates a Calvinist. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's really interesting to hear Fortunatus, a Manichaean making arguments uh, for determinism and Augustine, uh, fighting against that. And it's really an interesting discussion if you listen to it. But we don't know what we're talking about. We don't read the his historical facts of those kinds of things, uh, of course. But anyway, here, here, let's go past the ad hominem now of White's uh, complaint. Here's his complaint about my tweet, okay? And I want you to help me understand this, okay? What I, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why he's he's rejecting this idea that Calvinists believe someone has to be turned into a better person. Someone has to be better in order to believe in Jesus. I don't know that this is the foundation of their entire worldview. And so why regeneration precedes faith. That's the entire premise of Calvinism and regeneration does what it morally, it takes away your moral inability. It makes you a better ontologically better human being. That's what moral inability is. You're, you're not a good person. You're corrupt. So what you have a bad corrupt heart. So you're given a new heart. 
and your moral inability is taken away from you. That's better. <laughs> who, who would say it's not better to be regenerated? You're made into a better person in order to cause you to believe in the gospel. That is Calvinism. And yet white just comes at me for this. And it's really, really interesting to me. I, 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 I I'm looking forward to maybe pressing him on this point. You know, I, I come and, from, I come from a, a, a Calvinist tradition where I would dare say that my dad and his brothers, their father and their pastors would probably agree with you that it is ontologically superior, that they are better than the unregenerate. I dare say that that, that strain would actually agree with well, that. And it, when I was a Calvinist, I would have said, yeah, well, better by God's grace. I mean, yeah. I, it wasn't because I was better in and of myself. I would no, say it wasn't, I'm, wasn't I'm, I was, you did the merit, but you were you were yeah, given yeah. this ontological superiority. And and you now have the insight and the keys to the kingdom and you understand these things. And so, yeah, of course I'm I'm better than them. And I think I think, you know, there are some Calvinists out there that would own that as an ontological um uh, superiority or a benefit. Um so I, you know, I think I think white is not reflective or representative of all Calvinists here, because you're going to encounter some, they may be called high Calvinists or hyper Calvinists, but I, I dare say you're going to have many out there that would agree with you on that. And I, yeah, I don't, I'm not understanding why this is, well, let's let, let him speak for himself. Okay. He says, he says, being regenerate, being regenerated does not make you better so that you can believe it makes you a new create creature. So being a new creature is not better. I don't understand that sentence that, I mean, does it make any more sense to you, Warren? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to follow where he's coming from because I know he's a bright individual, which is in no way an improvement, Layton. Like, it, doesn't, regenerate. it doesn't make Being sense. Regenerate doesn't make you better. So you can believe. Yeah, yes, it does. Yeah. Being regenerated makes you ontologically and alive, um, able to see, able to understand, giving you a new heart so that you can believe the gospel so that you will believe the gospel. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm baffled. I, I don't know if maybe he thinks better means like more worthy to be saved or like you've earned it that's, or something. That's what Turton fan was noting in the comments is he, he's like, it doesn't make you more deserving, but. Well, that's but not what better necessarily superior. means. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, morality, when I think of somebody's moral life, and so I, I see somebody's moral life as this person lives a morally better life than this person over here who's just doing all kinds of sinful things, cheating on his taxes, stealing, cutting people off, cussing at people. This person's paying his taxes, nice to people, kind to people, loves people, regardless of whether they're Christian or not. You, you would say, okay, this one's morally a better person than the other. Well, on Calvinism, you're morally unable, corrupt from your very nature until you're ontologically changed into a better, morally superior person because you're now able to see and understand spiritual things that you couldn't before your, your corruption has, you get a new, you got a new heart for goodness sake. You don't have that moral inability anymore. I don't, again, I, I don't, I don't know what the, it seems like semantics really. Um, but chains removed slavery ended newness of life began. Sounds like all better things to me. Um, that reality is not even a part of their responses to the quite proper objection we make to their novel repackaging of semi-Pelagianism. Oh, there, there's the old boogeyman fallacy again, where instead of even defining what is meant by semi-Pelagianism, historically establishing it from Pelagius himself, which of course he would never attempt to, to, to do because he would, he would fail miserably based upon the evidence that I found. By the way, I actually go to the source. Oh, dang, I've moved it. It's over there. I've got a book. I've got a book by Pelagius, the his only existent writings that I've been reading through, trying to find his Pelagianism. Um, and there's a few few small parts that I've kind of I've underlined that could be taken in a bad in a in a in the way that some people accuse him of, but they also could be taken in another way. And then other things that he said that seem to counter the more quote unquote Pelagian, everyone's good kind of a, you know, things that he's accused of. Anyway, that's a whole nother conversation, but if there is no need to regenerate, by the way, for those that are just tuning in for this portion, um, go listen to either Warren's, uh, interview or both my interview with, uh, Ali Bonner 
and or Warren's interview with Ali Bonner, who is a, a, an expert in the field because she's actually read his all of his writings and have reported his uh, on his writings with regard to that issue. And so um, go listen to that if you'd like to, to hear more. Or talk to Warren. Warren, Warren knows quite a bit about that too, because I think you've done your, your own study as well. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so he says, if there is no need to regeneration, so as to have living, saving faith, then the question is a valid one. Why does one believe and another does not? Okay, so that's kind of like asking what what determines someone's choice to believe and another person, what does what determines another person not to believe? Because it's God on Calvinism, obviously. God is the one who determines those who will believe and won't believe. And so it's God's decision. And so if it's not God, then what is it, Leighton? And we would say, it's the agent. <laughs> it's my responsibility. And then they would say, okay, well, what determines you? Well, that assumes a deterministic answer is required. It's, it's, it's almost as if you're, you're question begging by assuming that there must be something that's determining my choice and that it's not free. And so, and again, that's not my argument. Um, I, I've read from sc- scholars who debate this between each other. I've read them make that argument. It, that is a question begging fallacy to even ask what determined your free choice as if your free will didn't determine it. It's like asking, why did God create you? Can you, can you tell us why God created you? Nobody, nobody can. Why, why did God create and why did he save you? James White. Did he have to? Was he he's he necess, necessitated to save you? Could oh, I'd he, love to have he, that conversation with him later. Could, oh, you know, I'm at the not to have that conversation. Could he have chosen not to save you? Because if you say yes, then you are you're admitting that that um God has libertarian free will because he could have chosen to do otherwise. Uh, he could have chosen not to save James White or even create James White. And if he says he had to create James White, then he was, of course, he's saying his his existence is necessary for God, and he would never say that. I, I wouldn't imagine. So is is God therefore um, not determining his own choice? Well, of course he is. So why can't we determine our own choices? In other words, if you can confess and admit that God's able to uh, determine his own choices, and God's an all powerful being, then why can't he create agents with the power of first cause choice? To be able to make their own choices, decisions that they're the determiner of their own choice, that the actor is the cause of his action, that the determiner is the cause of his determination, and stop looking for another determination besides the agent themselves. And and I, I again I don't know how to answer else to answer that question except to point out the fa- fallacious assumption that's read into that question: What determines your free choice? <laughs> A free choice isn't determined. It's, it's, it's determined by the agent. Okay. It's not determined by anything other than the agent. So looking for another, uh, well, cause get into this whole, for your choice we get into is the whole question conflating, begging. they conflate influence with, um, effectual causation, you know, and that's, that's, that's one of the big mistakes that they make in, in, in that, but it's, it's, it's easy to refute, but it uh, often it's one of those unstated premises that they're operating on that they're not even aware of themselves. Right. Which, which is really important. I'm glad you mentioned that Warren, because, we do have, we can have stated reasons why. So somebody says, Hey, why did you choose Jesus? And I can say, well, you know, I had this happen to me and then my influence of my mom and dad. And then I read this scripture and I really felt convicted here. And I, I can have all these reasons, these influences on my life. Um, but influences aren't determinative. They're influential. And so I could, I could list those influential reasons as the, as, 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 part of those things that led me to my decision, but I'm the decision maker. I'm the determiner because I'm a free moral agent. That's what separates me from animals or computer programs and those kinds of things that I am a determinative being. I make determinations. Now I, that, and now some people hear that, Oh, you're thinking you're just like God. Then you're giving yourself a godlike quality. Well, God made me this way and he didn't make me where I can thwart his will and his purposes. I, 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 my, my choices are limited to the confines of this creation, this world, this earth, this planet. I, I can't thwart God. Free will is not a superpower, as Pritchett says. So just because I have limited abilities doesn't mean I have the ability to thwart God or to thwart his purposes and his plan. God has sovereignly chosen that I have 
a free moral choice and that I could choose between a number of available options within that's with, with that's consistent within my nature, obviously, if that makes sense. Um, all right. So he goes, Leighton Flowers has answered that question. So he does acknowledge that I've answered that question. He doesn't, he doesn't acknowledge what my answer is. He says he's answered it repeatedly. Most laughable, no, most laughably, most laughably, I can't say that word, most laughably with the choice meets analogy. Well, one, the choice meets uh, comment was not in uh, reference to this question. And so that's false. Um, the choice meets analogy had nothing to do with this question. It was in response to R.C. Sproul keeping, he kept using the word choice as if it had to be Calvinistic version of election or choice. And I was giving illustrations of how the word choice can be used in many different uh, contexts. And it doesn't mean it the way that the, the Calvinist necessarily always thinks it's, it's, it's in reference. And I've also clarified and explained using the rest of the context of that video, showing the rest of the context of that video, that I explained that person is not chosen based upon the quality of themselves, but based upon the quality of the one in whom they trust. And so if Job, for example, is called a righteous man, and Paul says no one's righteous, how do you reconcile those two verses? Job's a righteous man, no one's righteous. So what? What? how, how do you reconcile that? Even, even Paul himself says Abraham was righteous. In this chapter, right after he just got through saying, no one is righteous. How do you reconcile that? The only way I can think of to reconcile that is to say, you're, no one is righteous in accordance with the law, but Abraham believed, and therefore he was credited with the righteousness of Christ because he believed. The righteous live by faith. And so they're not righteous on, based upon their own quality, like the quality of themselves, like a choice meat in the sense that the meat quality is better. They are considered choice and quality because of the one in whom clothes them, because they trust in Christ. So when they're called choice figs or good figs in Jeremiah 24, he's not saying they're better quality people that that were made better quality through some supernatural work of regeneration or something like that. What's he saying? They're better quality because of the one in whom they trust. They're, they're granted the quality of Christ on their behalf graciously. He doesn't have to do that. He chooses to do it to those who trust in him. And so I've, I've made that uh, explanation very, very clear to James White. Repeatedly. And, uh, yeah, repeatedly. And yet, and he knows it because he actually responded to it. Um, and so he knows it, but yet he still doubles down and presents it as if I'm saying that people who believe in Jesus are better people quality wise. They're better quality human beings, which is just lying at this point. I mean, that, that's just deceptive to, to tell people that I believe that when he knows that I don't, that's just being deceptive. Um, and he needs to repent of that in my estimation. And I'm going to ask him to do that at the debate just so he can prepare for that. Humility seems to be, uh, his main thing. My main thing this was interesting to me. Humility seems to be his main thing. Um, how many verses have we read that talk about humble yourself? He saves the humble, but brings lows, low those eyes who are haughty. These are the ones he looks on with favor, those who are humble and contrite at heart and who tremble at his word. Um, and dozens, not not just, a matter of fact, I think, I th and I'm not, well, I don't want to say this, almost every book in the Bible reflects on a person's meekness or humility as a condition for their being favored or helped or chosen or uh, looked on with favor or any of those kinds of, of that kind of verbiage in scripture. Has that been your finding too, Warren? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, if, if you're not humble, then you're saying I can do it on my own and you have a spirit of rebellion and you're going to, you know, strike out against yourself. So humility is is key to repentance. You, you see that in the teachings of Christ. You see that in the teachings of the apostles. You see that throughout the Old Testament, whether explicitly stated or implied, um, people are to humble themselves and say, you know, I I need you. You know, you're you're the source of life and truth and all good things, and and I need you. I I am not that mm -hmm. in in this universe that. I am not the center of the universe. You are. 
And it's in that spirit of humility that we confess our sins and cry out to him and he is faithful to hear and, and save us. And it, that, that's just the overwhelming testament of scripture is it's not that you, uh, you're, you know, that, that, that old song, you're so vain. You probably think the song's about you. You're like, Oh, you're just the humblest person in the whole world. You know, I'm more humble than anybody else. That's not what we're saying. It, it's just, it is a condition in which you have to recognize your, your need, confess it and, and trust in somebody other than yourself. And that, that person is God. Yeah. And, and this concept and idea that this, that humbly confessing your wrongdoings, humbling yourself, owning up to your mistakes, confessing that you can't do enough is some, is, is only a result of some kind of a supernatural enablement or a supernatural working of God is so far from what's intuitive and what most I think have experienced. I, I know many people who don't even know Christ who have had, you know, relationships that have gone bad um, with their children or their spouse or someone in their life, and they have humbled themselves, owned up to their mistake, asked for forgiveness, and and gotten reconciled with that individual. So if a, a, a pagan or an unbeliever can humble themselves to the point where they uh, are reconciled with another human being, what would make you just assume that everybody is born unable to, to do that in response to God's appeal to be reconciled. Again, it's just the special pleading that oftentimes the Calvinists will just bring to the text. Oh, well, the, well, with God's different. Oh, okay. Well, why? What, what verse says it's different with God? Because the Bible never indicates at any place that I've ever found that a person's not able to humble themselves, um, that they're because of their natural condition from birth, it, but it does over and over and over again, call them to humble themselves rebuke them for not humbling themselves and express expectations and angst for those who don't. <laughs> so why, why would you just assume this is a, a condition that you just can't do from birth? Um, and, 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 and Britain former, uh, uh, well, uh, one of our resident Calvinists, and he says, but there's no explanation why some people humbly confessed while others do not. In other words, let me, let me rephrase your question, Britain. What determines some people to humbly confess and others not to? In other words, what are you doing? You're question begging. You're assuming that the person is not the determiner. The agent themselves is not the one making that determination. You're assuming there has to be some explanation as to what determines them. Why? Because you have deterministic lenses sealed onto your eyes and you, you can't even see that determinism isn't necessary if you believe in free moral agency. It's like asking. There's no explanation as to why God saves some people and not others. Exactly. This is why that's a mystery for you. You have no idea why God chooses to save some and not others because you believe God is a self-determining agent that determines his own choices. And you just say, well, it's a secret counsel within his will. He just decided that he's going to save Brenton and not Joe Blow next door to him. He just decided. Oh, why did he decide that? Brenton, because you're better? Well, no, no, that can't be that. Arbitrarily then? Oh, no, it can't be that because then God seems capricious and we can't use the word arbitrary. So why does he choose you and not Joe Blow next door to you? There, there's no explanation. Why? Because God is a self-determining agent that makes his own decisions for his own secret reasons. But yet you can't grant that he creates people with their ability to make their own determinations. Thus, you're begging the question. And again, Brenton, you've been around long enough to know that. So you should never ask that question again. According to James White, if you ask that question again, you're deceptive and you're misleading people, according to James White's logic, apparently. But I won't hold you to that. You can ask the question all you want because you're still seeing it through deterministic lenses and so you don't agree and so you can't relate to what I'm saying. And so you're going to insist continually there has to be something determining his will. There can't, it can't, it can't possibly be a free will. It has to be determined by something. And you're going to continue to look for that thing, uh, and and you're gonna you're gonna continue to go on those that, that that circular argument. All right, I told y'all this was going to be about Jeff Durbin, and we are already thirty minutes into this, and we haven't even pulled up his video yet. So let's jump into here, and feel free to wave me down as we go through this, Warren. I know you're just uh, along for the ride, but feel free to to jump in and comment as you want to. We'll see how far we go. I'm 
getting caught up in the comments here. Some dialogue. Never read comments. the comments. No. <laughs> well, I mean, there's, there's yeah. been some good questions in there, yeah. but what frustrates me, and again, I say this it's respectfully from people that want to argue against this position, is like there's a guy in here specifically that's not even listening to what we're saying, and uh, <laughs> and and they immediately the reaction is, well, what about those? What about those that God didn't choose? How can how can you sit there and say that God chose some to go to hell and God didn't have fear? And it's just like you're not listening to what we're saying. Well, we're about to be on Romans nine, so stay yeah. tuned. Yeah, yeah, stay yeah, tuned. And, well, I, I don't know who it is that's on the side chat. Maybe they really aren't listening. Um, that's often the case with people in side chats. <laughs> so people in side chats are often having conversations with each other and have no idea what's being said on the screen. That's just a part of the the the, the YouTube game. Um, but. It, you can't always just assume that because someone disagrees with you, they're not listening to you or they don't care. Uh, between me and James White, who is actually listening to the other one? Because I actually listen to James White's rebuttals and his responses and, and respond to most of them ver verbatim, one, one right after another. Um, and, and he even says, I don't listen to Leighton. I don't listen to Leighton. Um, and he said, I don't listen to his rebuttals. And he will occasionally respond to a clip sent to him on Twitter. Uh, and that's that's usually one of the ones we'll respond to and reply to. And he usually makes the same exact fallacious arguments that he's made a hundred times before because he doesn't listen to our responses. And so he continues to make the same same errors over and over again. Uh, and, yeah. and, you know, this guy in here, he's saying, well, apology will never answer that. And I was like, dude, we've been answered, answered a hundred times. Time and time again. The, yeah. the simple answer is that God God's perfect and pleasing will. That's the simple answer. Yeah. That's his, his, he's the creator. In other words, God chooses to save one person and over, not another because he does, because that's what he chose that. I mean, it's not really an answer. It's just saying, because it's, it's in the secret counsel of his will. And that's, that's it. I mean, uh, again, you're, you're not answering the, the objection of the arbitrariness or the, the seeming randomness of God choosing one person over another especially in light of the repeated biblical revelations of God telling us exactly why he chooses to save one person over another. And, and given the fact that he tells us so many times throughout scripture, why he chooses to save somebody and harden another or save, uh, you know, I save the humble, but bring low those eyes who are haughty, humble yourself therefore, so that you may be lifted up. I mean, it, it there's no secret in scripture as to who God chooses to save and who God chooses uh, to to damn, um, and and the Calvinist acts as if it is just a secret, um, and and there's this this election in eternity past, and that those who humble themselves or those who do this is they're doing so as a result of being elected unconditionally, but again, they, I I don't think that's established, or I'm not convinced by it at least in Scripture. Creator, it's His decision to make, and who are we? old clay pots to oh, complain against that to answer back yeah. to God. exactly exactly that's really important and so like that's the bottom issue and so it's either god is completely sovereign or he's not sovereign at all and but what just frustrates me is instead of listening to what we're saying instead of actually looking at what the text says it's immediately well it's it's not fair it's, it's not firm fair. up your commitments yeah. to your tradition now here's the thing if i ever find my what is it, which is exactly what jeff is about to do firm up the commitment to his tradition of calvinism so that's again a question begging fallacy you're assuming your tradition's the right one and those people's are the wrong one and, and I would have to challenge, I wonder if Jeff Durbin's listening to us because I, I, I don't think he is based upon how he responds and how he presents these verses as if they'd have no counter arguments. Um, the clay pot analogy, as we've gone over a billion times, obviously with the, the Potter's Promise, obviously I've written on this subject and it's, and it's very well documented as, as going over this. But the Jeremiah 18, which is very likely, even some Reformed uh, scholars like Schreiner and others reference Jeremiah 18 as very likely being in the mind of Paul when he references clay pots. He, he does so in 2 Timothy 2, 20, when he talks about in a, in a house, there are earthenware, uh, cleanse yourself and you will be used for the noble purpose. And so that, that he still uh, maintains human responsibility, even referring to clay pots. In the Jeremiah passage, in Jeremiah 18, um, it's even more clear because he lays out, he says, if you go into the potter's house and the potter is, has a clay in his hand and the, and the, and the clay goes bad in his hands. Um, that's not the exact verbiage. You may remember Warren, the exact verbiage, but the, the yeah, it basically the, says if it spoils or, or spoils. Is marred in his hand, depending on the translation. Right now, 
do you are you suggesting and i don't think a calvinist would suggest this but maybe they would i i that would have to i guess if determinism is true that the marring is god's doing that he's marring the clay pot because determinism if determinism is true the marring is of god and and we would say no the marring is the the clay's fault um and i actually had a potter uh text me or message me i can't remember uh, Facebook, I think he messaged me after he would saw my book and, and said, he's actually a potter. He does this for a living and he has a studio. Uh, and he actually says this, that's exactly right about the clay. He said, I, I'm the potter. I don't mar the clay, <laughs> you know, must, but he said, but there's sometimes there's flaws in the clay that can become marred even while you're, you're using it. If you leave it out too long, obviously it can become hardened and, and unusable and you can try to do a lot of different things. And so sometimes what you'll do is if you get, if you've got a clay piece of clay, a lump of clay, and, and you're going to, you're going to make a certain kind of vessel with it. You, you have this plan. I'm going to use this to make um, a beautiful vase, for example. Okay. Um, and, and it kind of becomes marred and it's just not working. I mean, he said that, that lump just does not work for what, instrument you're wanting to make it for. He said, you can just squish it down. And he said, you might make it f into something else. Like you might make it into an ashtray or something that's smaller and doesn't, doesn't require to be smoothed out as well. And so he's given the perfect illustration of what he's talking about. So the, the, the clay is intended to be used for this beautiful vase, but because it's marred in his hands, he decides to use it for an ashtray instead. Okay. Because it's, it's sufficient to use for an ashtray. It wasn't sufficient to use for a beautiful vase because of its marring. Does that make sense? I think that's a, a kind of clear way of doing it. And that's exactly the illustration in Jeremiah 18. If, if the clay becomes marred in his hand, the sovereign, the potter, has every right to remold this marred lump of clay into a, an ignoble vessel, a chamber pot, a, a ashtray, even though he originally intended it to be a beautiful thing because of its marring, in other words, because of its sin, he chooses to use it for a common vessel instead. And he has every right to do that because if you read on in Jeremiah 18, it goes on to describe and say, if you relent from the evil that you intend to do, then I will change my intentions for you and shape you back into what I intended you to be. And, and so he, the, 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 the God, even through the prophet Jeremiah says, this is up to you. It's your responsibility as to what you will do and how I will shape you based upon how you respond to this warning. And so with that in mind, if you go into Romans 9 with a presupposition, which is, by the way, what I was trying to challenge in the debate with James White that he never answered because he kept just saying, Leighton didn't exegete the text, so he never answered the arguments that I made. He never addressed this point of contention. He never addressed his presupposition. What's his presupposition? Everyone's born an already marred lump of clay. Everyone's born in this total inability state and they're all on their way to hell and they are just horribly marred and they are because God destined would be that way from birth because of the fall. God punished everybody. They're all this marred lump. And if God wants to pull off a portion of that marred lump and reshape and remold it into something beautiful, the elect, and he wants to leave the rest of this already marred lump that's on their way to hell and he wants to pass them by and reprobate them for eternity, who are you to question if God does that? You have no more control over your beliefs and your behaviors than a pot has over its shape in the hand of a potter. And that's the way they interpret the text. But what if that's not what Romans 9 is about? What, it's, what if it's actually about exactly what Jeremiah 18 says it's about? Israel, who has become marred in the hands of the potter, i.e. I chose you for this noble purpose, this beautiful thing to bring the redemption to the world, the Messiah. And now you've marred in my hands. In other words, you're crying out, crucify him. We're not following him. We're not listening to Jesus. We're not even recognizing our Messiah. And God molds and shapes Israel in his hands who have now become marred. He shapes them into a common vessel that he uses to bring about redemption for the nations, the Gentiles. And who are you to question God? And so who's the interlocutor in the mind of Paul? It's that Israelite, the same interlocutor you see in Romans chapter three, who says, hey, if my unrighteousness brings out your righteousness, then why am I still to be blamed? Same thing he's answering in Romans nine. Hey, God, if you're hardening me, 
in order to bring about your purpose of redemption, then why am I still to be blamed for it? Who can resist your will after all? If you shape me like this and to be an ignoble vessel, if you made me into a, a, a basic, you know, chamber pot or a ashtray, why are you to blame me for being an ashtray? That's, that's the interlocutor in Romans nine. And that's what Paul is answering by saying, who are you? Oh man, to answer back to the sovereign, the potter who can mold and shape you a rebellious, already rebellious vessel that I've held out my hands to all day long, patiently longing to gather you like a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are unwilling all day long, holding out my hands to you. Who are you to talk back to me if I take you in your rebellion and shape you and use you as an ignoble vessel to cry out, crucify your own Messiah so as to bring redemption for the nations of the world? Isn't that beautiful? It's such a beautiful picture of the grace and goodness of God that he's not narrowing his mercy and his grace to a select few before, that he chose arbitrarily before the foundation of the world. But no, he's using already rebellious, hardened individuals in their rebellion, reshaping and remolding and using them to bring redemption through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. How beautiful is that? And when we understand it, you can see why. Now, again, you guys from Apologia Radio, if you happen to listen to this, Luke, Pastor Luke, who's talking right there on the screen, if you happen to listen to this, even if you don't agree with Leighton Flowers, can you at least understand why I'm passionate about this? Can you at least understand what I believe about this passage now and understand why I would speak out so vehemently against somebody who interprets this from a Calvinistic vantage point, given what I understand and how I believe uh, Jeremiah 18 is reflecting on what exactly what Paul is teaching? In Romans 9, 10 and 11, can't you understand that? Can't you relate to that at least? Brenton, in the side chat, can't you at least go, yeah, Leighton, I see where you're coming from. And if you're right, yeah, you're right. Calvinists are doing a huge injustice to what God's actually doing and what Paul is actually saying in Romans 9, 10 and 11. And, and I don't, maybe I don't believe you're right, but I can see it from your perspective. I at least see the duck and the rabbit now. I can at least understand why you believe what you believe. Could you at least meet me halfway there? Because I'm satisfied if you can at least get to that point. Because most guys who at least get to that point, they at least stop treating me like I don't care about the Bible. They at least stop treating me like I'm, well, there he goes with his analogies again. Hey, hey, choice me. Brothers, you can at least start treating me like a human being who loves the Word of God and is trying to do his best to help people understand the goodness of God's grace and his mercy for all people. And you can at least start, at least appreciate the fact that I care enough about these things to talk about them and to help people to see them from my vantage point. And you can at least say, you know what? I don't agree with that Leighton Flowers, but man, he really does love the Word of God and he really does try to help people to understand that God loves everybody and wants everyone to be saved. He's given his life to evangelism. God bless him. I don't agree with him. Man, he's misled. God's determined for whatever reason for him to reject Calvinism. But you know what? Maybe he's doing that to make me stronger in my Calvinism. Hmm. Maybe he's, he's there for a reason. And at least you can appreciate that. Sorry, I'm on my soapbox, Warren. Going on and on. So. <laughs> oh, no, you're, you're, you're good. I mean, I, I appreciate the passion. I, um, um, it, it's, it's frustrating. You can come in with an external critique. You can come in with an internal critique. And I don't think it really matters because it's a critique. And and certain individuals and certain groups, you know, I mean, no, nobody likes to be criticized anyway, but but certain groups are a little bit more um, insula in, uh, insulated than, than others. And, and, uh, and I think there's this natural inclination. I mean, even me, just let me, let me use some epistemic humility here. When you bring a criticism against me, dear Calvinists in the side chat, I don't like that. So obviously you're wrong. That's my first go-to. So I understand why the Calvinists would be the same way. But at some point we have to set that bias aside and go, well, let me look into these, you know, and see, is there, is there some validity here? And so when we're passionate and we're coming in and we're, we're, we're saying, this is why we disagree with your interpretation of scripture. Um, I, I think you need to exercise some humility there and, and consider what we're saying and go along with us. And it very well may be that, through the course of the process, we're both edified and we both come out corrected on various things and stronger for it. But um, I, I think there's this tendency in which um, it's easy, especially on, on YouTube, right? N just to listen to the criticism, not respond, to dismiss it, to mock, to belittle. And, uh, and we really lose that intimate 
uh, iron sharpening iron connection where we come in there, we go, man, you're wrong. And you go, well, let's, let's talk about it. Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you about it, you know, and, and you're able to have those conversations. But I, I think, I think there is this uh, inclination in which we just insulate ourselves and we say, I'm, I'm not, I can't be wrong about this. And I think, I think partly too, I think their soteriology feeds that because they believe that they've been regenerated and whether they'll yeah. confess that or not, they do believe they're ontologically superior to the unregenerate. And so yeah. if you believe you've been regenerated and given this, you know, this divine illumination about the truth of scripture, um, you know, that, that, that really can be um, a means to insulate you and, and perhaps blind you to criticism. Well, and it's also, you're off, oftentimes, at least I know I was when I was a Calvinist, kind of in my own echo chamber of Calvinism. And so I was surrounded by people, you know, who were in agreement with me. Um, and the only real uh, exposure I got to Arminians were when I got on, you know, chat boards or whatever, uh, which weren't always the best representations of Arminians. Um, and, and, and so I felt I, I was just more and more bolstered in my Calvinism every time I engage with one of these angry Arminians online, it's one of the reasons guys in the side chat, always critique me for not being more, you know, vitriolic towards Calvinist and shouting them down as heretics. I, I, I was there for a long time and I know it didn't work. <laughs> it just, it just, it just hardens me in my Calvinism. It's all it does. So when you're online and shouting down the Calvinist talking about, you know, quoting John three sixteen at them, like they never read it. Um, and, and you just keep calling them heretics and you know, all these things, you're just making them harder in Calvinists. You're, you're just, you're just making them more convinced they're right. It's all you're doing. Um, when you treat them with some level of respect, even though you disagree with them and you help them to feel like they've been heard, I am hearing what you're saying, guys, I understand what you're saying. I understand how you're reading Romans nine. I get it. I used to, I used to read Romans nine with a passion as a Calvinist, uh, trying to, you know, prove and bolster my, my Calvinism. Um, but the, the, the reverse is the same is that you can't do that to us. Calvinist, you can't just quote Romans nine at us as if we've never read it before, or, you know, quote Acts thirteen forty eight at us as we've, Oh, John six. Yeah. Don't you see this is draw, draw, draw. Don't you see draw? Yeah. We, we're, we're, we're real aware that the verse uh, we've actually written uh, books on the subject. So yeah, in broadcast, we, we, we're aware the fact that you're not aware of what we have said about that is more, more of the concern that I would have and, and, and don't have any level of respect or at least a willingness to hear out both sides instead of just, you know, throwing out ah, that choice meat thing or whatever, uh, you know, whatever the arsenal they have in their, in their, uh, quiver at the time, uh, Aaron, thank you for your super chat in regards to repentance. Uh, one can make a case that salvation is promised to those who repent using Psalm 50, 23. Yes. Yeah. Salvation's promised again. He's what he's demonstrating. Is there a condition? What is the condition for salvation? And Calvinists would agree that that faith, repentance and faith is a condition for being saved. They're, they would just say that God meets that condition or causes us to meet that condition by regenerating us, making us into an ontologically better human being, that, which is the argument we were making for, before. So God's the one who sets the standard and then he causes us to meet the standard through a, a, an effectual work. But the problem with that view is that he also causes you not to be able to meet the, the standard on the other end. And so God is just as much sovereignly in control of your inability from birth as he is your effectual, uh, your effectual nature to, causing you to believe after rebirth. And so that that's the problem with the deterministic Calvinistic system is that God is just as much to blame for you rejecting the gospel as he is to give being given credit for you accepting the gospel because neither one of them have you know, any meaningful control over whether they reject or accept. Um, if you're born a reprobate, then you have no meaningful control over your nature and desire to reject the gospel any more so than a regenerate man has over his nature and his desire to accept the gospel. So you have this, this, what, what ends up happening is the Calvinists are trying to give God all the credit for everything that happens in salvation. And in so doing, they actually blame God for all the rejection of his provisions and then therefore they have to post ad hoc rationalize, rationalize everything and say, well, oh no, God really doesn't provide for everyone. And that's why you have the L within the limited atonement because you, you can't have God providing things that he's not really intending for them to have because then you got God failing in the mind of at least some higher forms of Calvinists. Some, some Calvinists don't go that far. Um, 
All right, let, let's continue with the video. We're never going to get through any of this. So Myself roll. not paying attention to the text of God's word and just going back to my tradition, I'm, I'm having a problem. I'm having a theological problem I need to be willing to acknowledge. If you can hear this string of texts, all in context, all exegeted properly, all handled faithfully. How do you, you're assuming they're exegeted properly. That's begging the question. And so he, I know he's not debating right now, so he's not technically begging the question in a debate, but he is making a statement as if my tradition is the right one, yours is the wrong one. My exegesis is the right one, yours is the wrong one. Because I guarantee you, every single provisionist who knows what they're talking about, every single Armenian knows what they're talking about, can exegete those texts just as clearly, and we would say more consistently, obviously, and you would disagree, obviously. And so th this kind of a statement of just kind of this dogmatism of, of just, oh, my view is the right way. And if you, you know, you know, you're not accepting it, then you're just not, you're not a real lover of scripture. You're just not a true exegete. You're just going to mangle the text as you'll hear him talk about here in a minute. Well, I mean, hearing I mean, your first response is to, oh, is yeah, to I'm sorry, go ahead. Warren. His, his tradition, uh, his tradition tells him that he was created pre-programmed to believe lies, unable to rightly understand and accept spiritual things. And so there's some major, um, let's just say, uh, epistemic undercutting defeaters in his tradition that should give him pause. Uh, he doesn't believe that God was gracious and granted mankind faculties that could interact with him and uh, if, if used responsibly, uh, ascertain and, and come to know the truth when it's revealed to them. Uh, his tradition says, even when the truth presents itself to you, you are created unable to rightly understand it. You're always going to believe the wrong things in this, this spiritual, uh, the spirit about the spiritual world, the spiritual, these spiritual truths. And so for him to then say, well, you know, I'm, I think my exegesis is sound. Uh, well, it's like, cause I'm appealing to my tradition. Well, your tradition really casts doubt over your ability to even do sound exegesis at all. Why mm -hmm. should we believe you've been ontologically changed and regenerated such that we should trust you if we're to take your tradition, you know, and its teachings on it uh, as they come. I mean, we have we have nothing to really look to. We can't look to him. We can't look to ourselves because we're said to be in the same criteria. We can't look to scripture because none of us can rightly understand it unless we've been regenerated. But regeneration itself is a spiritual thing. He doesn't believe he can rightly right. understand. And plus you can't know if you've truly been regenerated, not until you get no. to heaven. Because if you're one of those people who cry out, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? What, what's prophesying in your name? They're speaking truth about the scriptures. If we prophesy yeah. in your name, perform miracles. And he'll say, I never depart from me. I never knew you. Well, if God decrees whatsoever comes to pass, that includes those people's false belief that they were Christians. They thought they were prophesying what God wanted people to know. God determined for them to think that on Calvinism, if Calvinism is true. How does Jeff Durbin know that he's not one of those people? Not, it wouldn't be possible if God determined for you to think you were saved. Is he going to fail in his effort to do that? No Calvinist would say he would fail in his effort to do that. So if God has determined, Jeff, for you to be one of those people who cry out, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Which Jeff does all the time. He prophesies in the name of Jesus. He, he proclaims the truth of God's word, what he believes is God's word. How do you know you're not going to say, he's not going to say to you, depart from me. I never knew you. You're a worker of iniquity. You cannot possibly know if he's determined for you to believe that about yourself, because you're believing in the kind of God who would do that to somebody. We don't believe in a kind of God that would do that to anybody. We believe in a kind of God that really genuinely loves all that he's created and desires for all of us to have right relationship with him. And so because we have a view of God's character such that we believe in his trustworthiness, then we're resting in his trustworthiness. So you say, well, Leighton, you could have the same doubts. Yes, I could have doubts in my abilities or my, uh, you know, my genuineness of my heart. Yes, but I'd have no doubts about his trustworthiness or his genuineness based upon what I believe the Scripture reveals about him. Um, I know this is a crass analogy, but it's like with my in my with my uh, my wife and my marriage. If someone brought me a video evidence, I mean, even video evidence wouldn't be evidence to me anymore with all they do with the you stuff you do with AI now. <laughs> I don't even know if I believe it. But if they could, if somebody could bring me, you know, evidence that was absolutely, uh, you know, secure evidence showing me that my wife actually had many husbands, some of which she really loved, some of which she really didn't love, but that she led to believe were her husbands in order to get what he that she wanted out of them, and I was convinced that she was the kind of wife who would do that, 
then how could I possibly know if I was really loved by her? I couldn't. Why? Because you've undermined the character of the person that I'm in a relationship with. And so I could not believe that she's trustworthy anymore. And that's what Calvinism is ultimately doing to the view of God for many people is that you're painting God as the kind of God who would deceive people into thinking they're truly saved when they're really not. And you can't possibly know if God's not doing that to you because you believe he's the kind of God that might. And if I believe that my wife is the kind of woman who might do that, then I can't possibly know whether I can trust her or that our relationship is, is genuine or real. Does that make sense? I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to say God's exactly like us in every regard of that, that in that category. But what I'm trying to say is that you have to maintain a level of, of, of a, a, a level of knowledge of God as being trustworthy in order to have an assurance of salvation in a trustworthy being, right? No, absolutely. I mean, you have you have to believe that he actually cares about you rightly understanding him. You know, I mean, if, if you're thinking that God from all eternity decreed, I don't know, the majority, 50%, a large minority of people to be completely and totally wrong about what they believe about him, um, and that he created you in that natural inability. I mean, there's there's so many defeaters here where you have to say, you know, I I'm up against I'm up against a real problem. I I I don't know how I actually can answer that. And I've not had anyone answer it other than just to double down on their regeneration and say, well, I know because I've been regenerated and this has actually happened to me and, and I'm not just projecting it and imagining it. But um, that I think is again, not really addressing, not really addressing the issue. They're just doubling down on it and plowing through and blind um, baseless confidence. But, uh, but I also, I also, I think most people don't understand these two objections that you and I are raising, especially in that particular, um, position or tradition, the way they're approaching it. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they're able to stop and understand the criticism that we're levying because that default answer kicks in. Well, I've been regenerated. That's how I know Warren. No, right. what I'm saying is, is regeneration is a truth. You were created according to you, unable to even understand. So you're appealing right. to the thing you can't understand as the means of which you understand it does not help. It's, it's circular and self-defeating, but most people really struggle with that. Jeff, I think is a really intelligent dude. Um, he and, and white are, I think very proficient debaters. I'm glad you're debating them. I mean, I would love to debate white, but, but I, I'm glad you're doing it. Uh, you know, it, I, I, I can honestly cheer you think on. You would I, have be a no... better, I, I think you would be a better match against white than I would be honestly, just because I think, um, and I'm not just saying that like to flatter my guess. I just watching your style, um, you're able to keep your, your tone and your, you're just very matter of fact. Mm. Um, and you keep your, your voice. I, I'm a preacher by, by heart. I'm an evangelist. I mean, that's what I was raised behind a pulpit preaching. And so, um, ever since I was 18 years old, I've been preaching behind a pulpit. So I get my preacher voice, you know, and even my kids are telling me just, you know, just talk like you do on your broadcast. I was like, I want to, but I, I'll get me, put me behind a pulpit. I'm going to start preaching. Um, especially if I'm talking about the love of God, I can't help it. And so some people say, that's great. You should do that. I just don't like that about myself. I think in a debate, it would be better if I could just talk like I am to you right now, but it's like your, your nature takes over, so to speak. And irresistibly, I begin to preaching, but I'm, I'm going to try to do my best to, to do more like you on that. Uh, when I, when I debate just to kind of stay, you know, oh, I appreciate more, the kind this, more of this oh, level and. You know. you, you've got you've got this, Leighton. You've 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 got the you've got the 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 knowledge and the heart for it, um, and you've got the platform, which is which is great. But I mean, both both White and 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 um, Jeff here, they're intelligent. They're intelligent agents. I mean, they're they're capable of engaging with the arguments that we present, reasoning through them in light of the scripture and their their worldview and everything that they know about reality, using using their God given faculties and understanding of scripture, they're able to do that. And so, you know, I, I just, every opportunity that I get, I want to implore them to do that. Um, mm -hmm. It's real easy to sit back and go, oh, they don't understand. They were never Calvinists or there they go beating that drum again. Ha ha. ha. But why? Why? Well, mm -hmm. just assume for a minute that you may be mistaken and we weren't eternally de decreed to do these things and that, uh, you know, that we do rightly understand it. You know, what's, what's an answer other than dismissal or mockery? What's, what's an actual, you know, substantive answer to this? And I, I haven't found, I haven't found a solid answer for the two objections you and I just raised, which would be, 
the undercutting defeater due to total depravity or the deity of deception intentionally decreeing you to have false beliefs. Um, right. I've, I've seen them double down on it, but I've never seen them actually provide um, a substantive solution or, or an answer to it. Well said. All right. Back to the video. Here we go. To just firm up your commitments to your tradition, then you're not faithfully reading the word of God and handling the scriptures the way that we ought to hold, uh, handle them. If you're just holding, if you're just holding to your tradition when you hear these things, but someone says, so you're saying that God chose to save some and not others. That's not fair. Again, mm -hmm. uh, justice is not what you want from God. You do not want fairness from God because fairness from God, justice from God would be all of us going to hell. So unbiblical presuppositions there in terms of fairness and justice and all. Okay. I, I would just say on that point, I, I, I agree in principle that under our view <laughs> that you don't want justice because you want you want God's grace because that's what God wants for you too. Um, and so if you believe in determinism, however, if you believe that God has reprobated most of humanity, and I say most because it's few are the few are the the those who find the path that leads to righteousness according to the scripture. So few and in, in relative and I'm not saying because sometimes Calvinists hear a few, how you know it's multitudes that will be saved. And I'm saying relatively speaking, it, it's few are those who will find it. And so if that's true, then it's few who are those who are elect in 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 uh, contrast to the those who are damned. And so the the question is then do you really want do you really want God making that choice? <laughs> because the odds are against you um, that you'll be one of the you know, lucky ones, the blessed ones that are picked. Um, and, and so if, if you hold to our view, then yeah, you're wanting God to make that decision. You really want, you know, want God's mercy and God, you want what God wants because you know that God wants what's best for that, which he's created. Um, but if you, if you believe in Calvinism, then those statements don't seem to jive with believing that God is what the Calvinistic version of his, uh, you know, his nature and how he works is. Does that make sense? I mean, it, it it seems to put it puts God in a in a bad light. And so I, I I would agree with what Jeff is saying if he was saying it from our vantage point, but saying it from the Calvinistic vantage point seems to undermine his case, in my opinion. Does that makes sense. And all the rest, what you're looking at in the doctrine of election is a, a um, exploration of God's justice and His grace. Mm -hmm. That's what you're looking at. Let me ask you this question: If someone says, "Well, like, well, He chooses to save some and not others," do you believe you deserve salvation? Do you believe anybody deserves salvation? What do you believe every human being does deserve from God? Again, we, we would agree with that. No, we don't believe anybody deserves salvation. Um, and you, you ask, what does everybody deserve? But but they're, they're much more deserving of hell on our view than on your view, is what we would argue. Because they aren't rejecting a God who first rejected them. They aren't They aren't just doing what they were naturally born to do, and they couldn't have done otherwise, on our view. On our view, they're free to follow God or to reject God. They have that responsibility. And they're rejecting God who loves and provides for them and who has provided a means and a way for them to be re reconciled and saved. And so they perish because they refuse to love the truth so as to be saved, as Paul put it. And so on our view, they're more blameworthy than on your view would be our argument. So we, we both believe they're blameworthy, but we're we're trying to say they're more blameworthy on our view intuitively, and I, 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 we'd also argue biblically, they're more blameworthy on our view. But we would also question you: How are they blameworthy on your view? In other words, what's the basis for blaming sinners for their sin on your view, given that they sin by nature from birth that they have no control over? What is the basis on which they're judged under a deterministic worldview? And that doesn't seem to make. To us, it doesn't seem to be plausible, and it seems to be irrational, and that's why we're pushing back on it. And if you answer that in the biblical, of, if in the biblical yeah. response, saying none of us deserve heaven, all of us deserve hell, then you shouldn't have any problem with God extending His grace to a people, and then determining to give justice to the others. So when God sends people to hell. And he decrees that he will allow this person to have their sin, to love their sin, to revel in their sin, and to end in their sin. He is giving them what they want. God isn't making anybody in scripture or in his testimony in history. He's not making anybody sin against their will. They are doing what they want to do. And Why do they want to do it? I mean, he, yes. just used, he just used allowance language, permission language, which is not at all compatible with 
the view of, of theistic determinism, unless he's trying to argue that God decreed they would have these inclinations, desires, that they would want to do this, and then he's going to allow his own decree to obtain. But he's not He's not saying that. He's saying, oh, these wicked people, God's going to allow them to do what they want, and then he's going to judge them for it. But that's that's actually not his position. His position is God decreed the ends and the means. He decreed everything. This is meticulous with specificity. Everything that obtains does so because God decreed it. So they want to do these things because God decreed it from eternity. He created the world in such a way to where they would want to do that. And then they'll question beg and say, well, they were free because they did what they wanted. And so God permitted that. But it's it's like that that game in, in uh, Vegas or New York, you know, you walk up and the guy's got the three cups and he's got like the the peanut or the M&M in there and the ball and he's moving it around and you're trying to find it. It's a shell game. And I don't mean that to say that he's necessarily doing that intentionally, but he's using language that's not at all compatible with, with his own presuppositions. And I think they have to default to that one because it's reality and two, it sells and presents better. Yes. Yeah. I, I can't, I, I can't agree more on that. Uh, he'll get more into that. So we'll probably make that point even more clear as he, he continues to, to draw out that, that exact issue. And actually, if God did not restrain them, they'd be much worse than they are. Right. What, what's he restraining? I, I always, always ask Calvinist this and I never get a, a good answer. What's he restraining? If, if all things are decreed by God, is he restraining what he decreed? So he decrees them to want to do this sinful thing, but then in time, he restrains them from doing what he eternally, because the, the decree is an eternal uh, in the past. Okay. So it's an eternity past before time began. And there's different lapsarian views on that. But generally speaking, no matter what lapsarian view you have, you still have the decree uh, of whatsoever comes to pass according to their confessions. And I know they hold to 1689. And so it does say that God decrees whatsoever comes to pass, which would include the sinful actions of men or the desires of men to f uh, perform uh, sinful acts that he steps in, I guess, in time and restrains. So he decrees them to want to do sin X. And then in time, God steps in and restrains somehow from them doing sin X. It's Does that not, make any sense? It's not. I, I think one move that they could make is a move that uh, Britton mentioned in the side chat a minute ago. I tried to comment, but I'm, my my uh, my responses in the side chat aren't posting for some reason. But I, he, he referenced um, divine simplicity. And so it, it's possible that they could appeal to a strong form of divine simplicity where there are no distinctions at all, that all of God's actions and attributes are identical with God. So they they would say that the distinction of God decreeing and permitting are just mere distinctions we're projecting onto God that they're actually synonymous, that God's love and God's wrath, God's judgment and God's act of creating, God's condemnation, God's saving, God's forgiveness, God's destruction. These are just projections that we put onto him because he's simple and he has no parts. And in that view, everything essentially is a part. And so it all collapses uh, under a modal collapse where everything becomes necessary and indistinguishable. But that, that is a move that they could make to where then when they say God decreed this and permitted it, they really mean the same thing, but it's it's incoherent. And uh, yeah. and I've got a video we're actually doing tomorrow on the channel on that very topic, responding to Brother Gavin Ortland on that. So um, I definitely encourage people to check that out. But I, I don't think that that is a, I don't think that that's a smart move because you end up with issues with the Trinity. You end up with issues with the character of God. You end up with issues where you and I are necessary and co-eternal aspects of God. It, it, it gets pretty ugly. So I, I think that I don't, I don't think, despite what Brenton said, I don't think that Jeff is necessarily appealing to divine simplicity here. I think he's just accidentally being um, inconsistent and unintentionally. So I don't, I don't think it's, yeah. I don't think he's yeah, trying to be deceptive. I just think nobody, nobody intentions intends yeah. to be uh, inconsistent yeah. or contradictory, but I, I think it, it ends up having to be inconsistent or contradictory or at least nonsensical. Um, real, real quick before we move on, let me, let me uh, acknowledge some of these super chats. Bruce, appreciate your super chat. Aaron Peer Pearson in regards to repentance. I already went over that one. Um, 
Oh, this, one's, this one's funny. Roddy, next time James White misrepresents something you've said, just sigh and telling he's telling him, tell him he's rounding it out. Cause he's always, he always flat, says he's flattening it out. We, oh, James, you're just rounding it out. I may, I may use that. That's, that's pretty funny. Uh, I like that. <laughs> James, that's you're good. just rounding. James, you're just rounding it out. That's good. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Okay. Yeah. What's that mean? Um, sorry for the alias. He says, uh, uh, Justin Peters says on several occasions that God decrees all, even all sins. Can you address this? Yeah. And this is basic Calvinism. Um, God decrees whatsoever comes to pass, which would include all sins. Um, that's just what Calvinism is. And, and some Calvinists, uh, try to move away from that and they say, well, we're, we're compatible. It's not determinist. Well, that, 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 that's not true, uh, because compatibilism is, if you understand it, is not a denial of determinism. Compatibilism is an affirmation of determinism, theistic determinism, uh, if you're a Christian. And so it's affirming theistic determinism is true while also maintaining that humans are still mysteriously responsible. Calvin claims that he doesn't know how God's not the author and the prover of transgression, but he believes that he is. The, the, uh, he is innocent, in other words. God's not implicated in evil, but it's a mystery as how he's not given determinism. And so they'll, they'll claim on one hand, man's responsible for what God determines them to do. It's basically what compatibilism is. God's re man's responsible for what God determines them to do, and therefore human responsibility is compatible with determinism, is a simplified way of, of explaining det uh, Calvinistic determinism. All right, so let's go back to the video and listen to what he says. Right. I mean, I, I, one illustration I use is even in the ministry of Jesus, where the how many times in the ministry of Jesus do you see the Jewish leadership, scribes, Pharisees, or others um, uh, wanting Jesus dead, picking up stones to kill him, and Jesus somehow slips out of their eyesight or Jesus gets out of it. So God had to decree sovereignly and unchangeably for those people to desire to kill the Messiah. And then in time step in and restrain them from doing what he decreed for them to desire to do. If what you claim is true, because everything that comes to pass is decreed by God, which would include the desires of the Pharisees to kill their own Messiah. And so you, you have to have, uh, I'm just, in other words, I'm just stating behind the scenes, what has to ha happen on Calvinism for Calvinism to be true. Because if you believe God ordains whatsoever comes to pass, decrees whatsoever comes to pass, that means the intentions of those Pharisees was decreed by God. The origin of their uh, their sinful desires was from the decree of God, not from them, because then in their minds, at least, it would be God learning and God like, you know, seeing for the very first time, oh, I'm surprised and shocked by their desires. And because they have to have God as either being shocked off his throne or all deterministic, it, it can't be any kind of a middle ground between those two, those two views. Do you want to comment on that? No, it's just, you know, in Calvinism, pick something. If it obtains, it's because God eternally desired and decreed it to bring bring it to pass. That would be with the instance of Joseph, you know, they'll often bring up the brothers and they'll go, oh, look, God, God, you know, intended, they intended it for evil, but God intended. It's a reintending. It's a repurposing of an existing thing contextually. But what they won't say is generally that God from all eternity ordained and effectually brought about the slave trade so that he could re bring Joseph out of the pit to, to Egypt and that God eternally ordained the lust of Potiphar's wife, that God effectually ordained that she slander and lie to him, you know, from all eternity. And he, he permitted her to lust because he had eternally decreed her to lust. And when you actually start pulling the, uh, the, uh, the, the softening, the, the softening of this view, if you pull that away and you just kind of expose it as it is, you have a really strong claim that they have to defend because you don't have God merely lovingly permitting sin, calling people to repent, promising to forgive and redeem it. But you actually have God bringing about all sin and evil. Um, and the Bible tells us he doesn't even tempt anyone, let alone eternally and effectually decreeing all sin and evil with specificity. So, it, yeah, I mean, determinism is determinism. You know, to quote uh, Guillaume Billon, my favorite uh, philosopher to say, Guillaume, I love his name. It's Guillaume, it's brilliant. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's but to excellent. quote him, you know that is determinism. You know it. Uh, that's yeah. what it. That's what it means. It's everything is everything. Yes, that's true.
of it and they don't have any ability to actually kill him by why they're being restrained from God. Jesus says, you don't have any power over me except that which is given to you by God. They can't take the life of Jesus until Jesus says, now's the time. Yeah. Now the father will let you do to me what he has determined um, that you will do to me. Now, if someone says, really, God determined that they would murder Jesus? Uh, yeah, that's what Acts 4 says. Acts 4. Yeah. Uh, that gathered in this uh, city against your holy servant Jesus, Pontius Pilate, Herod, the Gentiles, the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand predestined to occur. Now, wait, Jesus said before they couldn't do it until it was his time. And then it actually says, oh, yeah, they all gathered against Jesus to do what God had determined they would do. But wait a minute, they wanted to kill Jesus, right, many times, and they were thwarted by God. But when God allows them to have what they want, they kill Jesus. And, and when, when people go to hell for their sin, they're not going to hell for their sin because God's like, they're really wanting God, and God's like, no. Right? Like, I, so want, I so want salvation, and God's like, no, not you, them. That's not what the Bible teaches. Hmm. No sinner is— And nobody's accusing Calvinists of teaching it that way. We're, we're saying that they're born uh, hating God and hating his ways because God decreed for them to be born in that condition due to the fall. So they've inherited the guilt of Adam and they've also inherited this natural condition where they hate anything that comes from God unless God regenerates them, makes them into an ontologically better human being um, and causes them to want to believe in the gospel. And and that seems to be a uh, perfect uh, definition of favoritism and partiality because you've got everybody in the exact same boat before creation. And, and God arbitrarily, seemingly arbitrarily, seemingly random, uh, even though they may not use those those verbs uh, to describe it, it seems to be that way. Pick certain people, unilaterally causes them to believe and passes over others, unilaterally causing them ultimately to to reject the, the gospel. And so that that's what we're pushing back against. Um, and, and, and this whole thing of bringing about the crucifixion, we've talked about this a dozen times before, proof that God intends a particular event to take place by the hands of evil men does not mean that he tempts men to do evil or that he causes them to do evil or that pride and lust are from him because the Bible explicitly denies all those things. God can know and use them in their evil intentions to bring about a particular event that is evil, like the selling of Joseph, like the, the hardening of Pharaoh, like the hardening of Israel to bring about the second Passover, just like he hardened Pharaoh to bring about the first Passover. God can remold and reshape that already marred lump to cry out, crucify him in order to bring about his plan of redemption. So we don't, we don't deny that God determines things. We don't even deny that God determines some evil events that will come to pass, but God doesn't have to be the instigator of evil to do that. God can right. know and use evil creatures in their already evil state to bring about a good purpose through their evil actions. And he doesn't have to, you don't have to have determinism to do that. I mean, in, in Genesis three, you have, you have the, the proto evangelum where God is telling them because of this, you know, he will crush your head and uh, the serpent will bruise his heel. God knew the nature of the serpent was to strike. He wasn't, he wasn't causing the serpent. He wasn't decreeing. He wasn't effectually ordaining it from all eternity and giving the serpent a sinful and wicked nature that would be desirous of it. That was something that the serpent cultivated in himself but he knew it was the serpent's nature to strike. And so he uses these inclinations and desires of, that are already evil, already existing intentions, and he brings those to pass so that he can actually redeem man out of that. And, um, and this is pretty well established throughout you know, Christian history, that God will use an existing evil, and he will use that for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It doesn't mean he's eternally decreeing the lust of Potiphar's wife, but he will repurpose it for good. Um, and in the meantime, the, the the beauty of God is that he is also being patient with the sinner and he is he's waiting on them to repent and he's calling them on to repent. And should they not, should they harden their heart, he's, he's going to judge them for that. So you see the multi, you know, we talk about flattening it out. Uh, let's round it out a little bit. We see the dimensions in which God is working in that without decreeing the evil intentions. And, uh, and that's, that's, I think, I think that's something that often gets overlooked in these discussions. Very, very well said. Is going, I really want Jesus. I really want to know God. I really love God. It says we're actually by nature, children of wrath. We are rebels. We're hostile to God. We're haters of God. We're non God seeking. We're not good. Actually, we have on record atheists saying, I really want God. I would really want to know this if it's really there and true. Um, and there's no reason to doubt that they would be genuine in that. Um, I really want to teach Calvinism if it's true. I mean, I, I I don't want to teach things that are false. If determinism is true, I hope God determines me to start teaching determinism. I really do. I, 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 I know my heart. 
I know I genuinely want that. Um, I have no reason to believe that Derek Webb and other atheists who were former Calvinist, when they express their desire to be a part of whatever God's doing, that, that they would say, well, yeah, I hope God determines me to believe if that's what's true, but maybe this is all real and I'm not chosen. Um, so there, there's on record people who are in unbelief expressing their desire to be a part of the kingdom and to know God and to be a part of this world uh, that he has created with right relationship with him. And so th that's just demonstrably untrue that there are people out there. Plus, what about the, what about the, the ones Jesus talked about? Did we not prophesy in your name and perform any miracles? Don't these people seem to be expressing their desire to be a part of what God's doing? And the reason on our view that they're denounced as not ever knowing God is because of the genuineness of their heart. They, they were far from him. They didn't really know him. They had a form of righteousness, but were whitewashed tombs. They were, they had the outward appearances, but they never had relationship. They never knew him in a, in a relational sense. It wasn't because God didn't really want them and somehow was decreeing for them to think they're Christians when they're really not, as it would have to be on the Calvinistic system. All right. Continue. Good. We're not righteous. That's our condition. We're not able to come to God apart from the drawing of God. So there is nobody in this portrait that actually wants Jesus and the father saying, no, no, actually they're worse than, than God's allowing them to be in their heart of hearts. They would be worse, but God determines to give some justice, which is what they want is their sin and not God. He gives them what they want. They're going to hell because of what they want, their sin, their wants, their desires, their will. And there are others where God. So they're going to hell because of what they want. Yet, according to your interpretation of Romans 9 in a little while, he chooses to save one brother and damn the other before they do anything good or bad. Untie that knot for me, uh, Jeff. So you're saying they're condemned for what they want, and yet you're saying they were chosen for damnation or salvation prior to even being born and having that want. And so what you're ultimately having to have is God foreseeing their wants. And so God, according to your own vernacular, God has to peer through the quarters of time to see the wants of the reprobate, to see and learn, I guess, that they want to reject Jesus and therefore choose them for reprobation, damnation, based upon what he foresees they will want. No Calvinist would say that, obviously. What they would say is God ordained all things, including their very wants. He decreed their very wants. And so he decreed them to be born wanting Satan and not God and judges them accordingly. And that's just theistic determinism. Do you, and and he, notice he would never make it that clear to his audience because his audience would go, what? Because when Calvinism shows what's behind the curtain and shows the reprobation side of it, and what he's really saying in the whole scope of the scheme of the system, people begin to drop like flies away from the Calvinistic system. It's only when you paint Calvinism from the one side, from the positive side and all the positive vernacular and all the palatable ways of explaining it, that you continue to have this large mass of following. It's only when people like us come along and go, wait guys, hey, you look behind the curtain. Do you see what's really going on? And then people begin to fall away from it because they begin to see it's not a, a tenable and workable or logical or biblical way of looking at God or uh, humanity for that matter. God gives grace to, and he provides redemption for, and the Holy Spirit of God regenerates and gives them eyes to see and gives them the ability to believe in Jesus, which they would not have done before. There is the grace of God, the mercy of God, and the justice of God on full display in election. Right. And to sum that up, nobody in that explanation gets injustice. Right. Right. So nobody gets that's true on our system. Nobody would get injustice on our system because on our system, there is true accountability, uh, true responsibility. They're actually responding to God freely. They're not being causally determined to respond the way that they do either by being born a reprobate or being born someone who's elect and uh, effectually caused to believe. And so, you know, sometimes they make statements that we would agree with in our worldview, but we would disagree with given their worldview. And sometimes that's hard to unpack. You got to kind of explain that. He gets right. what, they, what exactly. they didn't deserve. Right. Um, exactly right. It's either justice or God's free grace. And interestingly, um, 
justice is satisfied by God with both camps. Yes, either so, on the cross or on sinners and hell. That's critical. When people try to address this in some say, way saying, well, that just shows part, God's showing partiality. No, God's showing no partiality and judgment. He's showing mercy and grace, but he is not ignoring the sin and the justice that is due. Yeah. What so do you think Jesus was doing on the cross? When people <laughs> misrepresent Calvinists and they're like, well, that's just God showing partiality. He's just saying to you, I'll save you and not you. That's just partiality. Nope. God's, it's a category of mercy and grace and justice over here, but it's not partiality. Why? Because God is actually executing his justice and wrath on behalf of both camps. Those who God has determined he will give justice to and they go to hell, what are they going to hell for? Their sin. Mm -hmm. The Bible doesn't say we, that people go to hell for their sin. Um, not ultimately. They go, to, they go to hell because of unbelief. They refuse to love the truth so as to be saved. Jesus said, when he came to the world, he said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I'm not coming here to judge you for your sins. What will judge you on the final day, according to Jesus, John chapter 12, is the very words of Christ. The very words that I've spoken to you will judge you on the final day. In other words, what you do with the gospel is what will judge you on the final day, not how many sins you committed. There are sinners in heaven and hell, people. There are, there are people who sinned more in heaven than some people who sinned less in hell. <laughs> in other words, the, the amount of sins you committed is not what determines whether you go to heaven or hell. What ultimately determines whether you go to heaven or hell is whether or not you listen to the truth of God. If you suppress the truth, that is your fault. You will end up, you will end up in hell, not for ultimately Adam's sin or how many sins you committed versus somebody else's number of sins they committed. You will end up in hell because you rejected the words of Christ, because you rejected his truth. Exactly. Their sin. And they are paying the penalty, the eternal penalty of their sin. Be and because of the justice of God for all eternity, that they wanted their sin. But for the... Notice he never says why they want it. Because for him to spell out why they want it, they wanted it from birth for reasons beyond their control. God chose them for that. God destined them for that desire. They could not control that desire. So, so imagine condemning somebody for wanting to drink because you're born naturally wanting to drink. I mean, we have to drink. We, we, we long for drink. Imagine condemning somebody to hell for wanting water. And that's basically what you have Calvinists doing. You, you have Calvinists condemning people for, for doing exactly what God created their nature to be, to want to do these bad things and to reject God. And God's sending them to hell for that desire, for that longing. And that's not ever taught in Scripture. It's not the, 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 that's not what laid, it's laid out for in the good news of the gospel or even the wrath of God. The, the wrath of God is expressing God's justice and his anger towards that which separates him from the objects of his affection. That's what wrath is. Wrath is being poured out upon that which separates him from what he loves, which is the crown of his creation, humanity. He created to be in relationship with him. What is the chief end of man? To love God and glorify him forever. That's the chief end of every single individual on provisionism. It's only the chief end of the elect on Calvinism. We believe God created us all to be in relationship with him, and he desires us all to be in relationship with him. Go ahead, Warren. Yeah, I was, was going to say, in, in this system, because it's theistic determinism, there, there is no real actual sin. You know, <clears throat> we're familiar with the term uh, of sin, defining it as to miss the mark. In theistic determinism, God has a handful of, of red darts and he's got a handful of yellow darts and he throws them and every one of them hit their target perfectly. Every one of them are in perfect obedience. They're hitting the mark. None of them miss the mark because God is throwing them perfectly. According to their certain metaphysical models, they're not going to miss. They're going to obey perfectly. So he talks about how there's not this, you know, mistreatment of injustice, but you actually have God eternally damning and, and punishing people for perfect obedience. And they're going to say, well, that's the objector in Romans. No, actually, the objector is a is an Israelite who's upset about the inclusion of the Gentiles. Right. And they won't even address the system that there is no sin or missing the mark in their model. Yeah. And, and again, the, the, the way they may, well, you're missing the mark of his prescriptive will, not his decreative will. Yeah. And so, and, and then you say, oh, do you have any control over that? No, you will always do exactly what he decrees you to do. 
So he tells you to hit the mark prescriptively. Outwardly, he says, I want you to hit this mark, but then to creatively causes you to hit this mark instead. And yet, mysteriously, we're still to blame for that. And don't question me. If you do question me, I'll quote Romans 9 out of context as if it's Paul defending determinism versus Paul defending against the uh, the rebellious Jew who is now being uh, remolded and reshaped as a marred lump in the hands of a potter for an ignoble purpose to cry out, crucify him so as to engraft the Gentiles. Let's just ignore that context and just insert determinism into Romans 9 and say Paul is defending determinism. Um, when that's never, uh, never established. You, you mentioned, you mentioned the wills of God, the different wills of God. And I know I, I I'm, I'm can't say hundred percent. I'm very confident. James White is against uh traditional understanding of divine simplicity. He'll make an appearance in tomorrow's program, by the way. Um, I'm assuming Jeff also would reject divine simplicity, but for the Calvinists that do affirm it, they would say that those two wills that are often appealed to by Calvinists are mere um, conceptual uh, distinctions that we're projecting onto him that he actually doesn't have two wills. So if they're a Calvinist and they're affirming divine simplicity, they can't appeal to the two wills. So there's there's not a lot of options for our Calvinist brothers over hmm. there. To, I look uh, forward to, to listen them. to that because I hadn't thought through that argument before. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I'll, uh, I'll have to tune into that and listen to how you, how you lay that out. Interesting. Redeemed. God hasn't ignored his justice. He's showing no partiality. He actually says, I'm choosing to give you grace. And in doing that, it is my son that will receive the justice that was due to you. So justice isn't being ignored on anybody's account. It's either in Jesus or it's on your head. I think one thing even sincere believers struggle with is they hear that. And the accusations of partiality or God showing some type of favoritism are, we, we struggle to reason through it because it's like, well, why did God choose this person, but not this person? If you're telling me it's not on the basis of anything they've done, either good or bad, right? Which is what Romans 9 that we'll get to is saying, like, upon what basis? Like, well, I mean, God has a morally sufficient reason. Now, notice he's assuming that the, the choice between Jacob and Esau was for salvation. Just now when he said, see, we'll, we'll see, it's not on the basis of the good and the bad. W w one, I, I just need to point out, why even mention the good and the bad that the twins end up doing if God is the one who ultimately decrees all the good and the bad they end up doing? Wouldn't he decree for those he's elected to salvation to do that which is good and right and pleasing? Of course. And wouldn't he decree for those who are evil and bad and reprobates to do that which is not pleasing and not good? Of course. So why does Paul even refer to God does not take into account the good and the bad they end up doing? if God's the one who's ultimately decreeing the good and the bad they end up doing. That just doesn't make any sense. The, the reason that he's referencing the good and the, the free actions of these creatures in the future is he's saying, no matter what these twins end up doing throughout their life, um, um, I've got to take that. Warren, <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to you to talk for a second. Welcome to Sociology 101 with your host, Warren this is, Drew. This is live. Everyone be sure I'll to be right back. Pillar, like, subscribe, ring that bell. Um, <clears throat> oh, man, this was sudden. I've got my son over here uh, while I'm on mute asking me uh, when I'm going to make dinner. And I thought, that's okay. I'll be able to talk to him while Leighton is talking. And in a rare fluke, uh, Leighton stops talking on his program. <laughs> <laughs> and allows me you didn't hear that did you <laughs> i hear everything oh no i'm in trouble i'm busted <laughs> but that was a good one that was a good uh, that was a good slam actually no, but my son my son's asking me he's like dad are you talking i'm like it's okay i'm on mute what do you need he's like when are you making dinner and i was like let me answer that question and you bolt i'm like i wasn't listening my to doorbell rang now. my doorbell rang and i had to t I had to sign for something yeah. so <laughs> i got it Oh. The rare, the rare occasion that I shut up. Yeah, that's that's very true. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I, you know, I love you, brother. You know, I love you. No, hey, uh, you had the perfect opportunity to you know advertise for all I mean, kinds of stuff yeah. there, and I, I better prep you for it. Subscribe to Idol Killer. <laughs> hit the bell. You know, hit the notification. Subscribe. That's right. That's yeah. right. I could have guessed. I guess. I guess I could have just played the video and said, "Hey, listen, listen to these these guys that." Uh, at Apologia Studios talk. That's that's, that's true. You need, left me with need, nothing to go with. We, we need to, we need to go with what the video goes. Okay, let's go back to the video. Right. Reason within his own counsel, he's the ultimately wise one. Yeah, not you, right. not me. And we know from his word, if we're going to take that as our testimony, that it's not because you were better, you were smarter, you were better. Your choice, me. No, you actually are better. You're made into a better human being by a work of regeneration. So, and th again, we, 
we all believe what we have is because how God created us. Okay. So if God created us with the liberty of the will to make choices that are real and meaningful, that we have the free ability to respond one way or another, um, then that's the way he made us. And so if, if you believe he made us in such a way that we would always reject him until he intervenes and causes us by a work, a supernatural miracle to accept him, then it, it's not taking, it's, it's, it's not any different from either perspective that we're giving credit to God for what makes us and who we are. And so this, this is sometimes where you'll get the accusation. Oh, you believe it's in and of yourself. And it's not, no, we're not going into a tool shed and building ourselves a free will. Okay. We're saying God made us this way. This is the way he created us. He sovereignly decreed. If you want to use that terminology, he sovereignly decreed for us to have the liberty of the will to make decisions in response to his light and his revelation. And thus we're held justly responsible for what we do with his light and revelation. He doesn't determine our choices in that regard. That's our view. And so just, just to be clear on that. It, mm -hmm. It's it's not on any of those external qualities that he shows favor. Right. What does Deuteronomy chapter seven tell us about Israel? Right, I didn't set my love on you because you were more numerous than the other nations. I set my love on you because I love you. I love you. That's the basis right. of my electing grace is yeah. this free love that I lavish upon you. Right. And every Israelite um, is saved. Right. Of course not. No. So what's it? What's that demonstrating? He's. It's not about choosing Israel for sal if effectual salvation of individuals. It's about choosing Israel to be the means through which the gospel would come. And so to demonstrate his blessing for them and his provision for them and his desire to have relationship with them too, which he has for all mankind, because remember he chose, chose Israel to be a blessing to all the families of the earth, Genesis 12, three. So he not, he's not choosing Israel to the neglect of all the other families of the earth. He's choosing Israel to the benefit of all the other families of the earth. Okay. And so he wants all of them saved too. He wants to, he loves salvifically all of them and wants all of them to be saved just like he does all the other nations of the world. But he has blessed them to be the seed through which the Messiah and his message would come. And so that's the doctrine of election. According to our view, the doctrine of election, according to their view is that God chooses some people to the neglect of others. And we're saying, no, no, no. He chooses some people to be a benefit to the rest. And everybody has the freedom, even those he's chosen as vessels sometimes rebel. Um, even uh, Dr. Wagner, I think, makes a case in one of the broadcasts I've had him on that even some of the people he chose to be messengers, prophets, very likely weren't saved. And he makes a case and shows some scriptures which seem to indicate, yeah, that guy may not have been a believer. Um, that guy may not have ever been saved, yet he was chosen by God. Well, Judas would be a good example of that, I guess, because obviously he was chosen to be an apostle and a messenger and uh, ends up not being saved because God, and, and some people say, well, that, that was all part of God's plan because it was prophesied. Yeah, prophecy means that God knows what's happening and God is prophesying, saying this is what's going to happen. It doesn't mean God's causing it to happen. There's a big difference between knowing something will happen and causing something to happen. There's a big difference between those two. Go ahead, Warren. I was just going to say, and in, in, in it's very common in Christian circles to conflate um, prophecy where through a prophet, God is declaring what he intends to bring to pass by way of his intelligence and power. And um, uh, typology, which is a method in the New Testament that's utilized to expound on a previous event in a grander and newer way and saying he was a type of this. He was a, an example of this, but in a more profound way. And you have both of those going on in scripture, but the average Christian generally has not been taught um, proper biblical exegesis, and they don't know how to distinguish between these. So everything becomes prophetic. And this feeds that idea of exhaustive theistic determinism where everything is meticulous. And, and it's, it's really, it's, it's just, it's, it's a, it's an easy misstep to make if, if you're not aware of these nuances in scripture. Yeah. Well, well said. Right. right, which is what Ephesians says. He mm -hmm. lavishes it upon us in all wisdom and insight. He's the one that knows best, yeah. not you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that word lavish. Yeah. Lavish. <laughs> Get your lamp, bicycle out. I just think about being like submerged Crying. or like yeah. just covered. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, I can't hear that word anymore without, let's say, hearing that, that one guy that does the animal videos. Tony Baker. Tony Baker, and he's like, Crying. lavish. Um, <laughs> do you have more verses? Yeah. Uh, can, we, can we do t just 10 more minutes? Yeah, I want to actually, I'm going to do you gotta a little get bit to more. Nine. Can you, can you start that? I'm going to, yeah. sorry, I'm going to take a bathroom break while this, Yeah. these two. Look, see, Jeff. Jeff leaves the studio too, and notice it, the guys in his studio just pick up right, right where he leaves. There's not even a pause here, Warren. I know, I know. I think, I'm I think just, they coordinated this though. And yeah, and, no, um, you're probably right. I, I, I assumed that since we both had buckets under our desks, this would never happen. 
um, I, if, if we were in the same room, I wouldn't be able to use the same approach because uh, I'm shy. But um, I would have to be going the uh, the Jeff Durbin route. I'd have to excuse myself and leave. <laughs> Man, you've got everybody slamming me now. Look, look, Adam, even Adam's jumping on the bandwagon. I'm freely willing, Leighton, to always pronounce all words correctly. <laughs> <My power. laughs> Oh, I love it. Well, friends like y'all, I don't need enemies. Man, pointing out all my mistakes. All right, so let's go. Let's do Just two Here guys, we. handle this. Yeah, no worries. All right, so Romans 9, obviously it's the big one that is in discussion and debate when these things come up. Mm. And when you hear this text gone through from beginning to end and exegeted properly, like I haven't heard a non-reformed defense of this text that doesn't completely end up mangling it yeah. and mishandling it. It's a lot of, um, a lot of eisegesis going. I, I would... I would give probably at least, if I was a betting man, I'd probably be, bet at least $1,000. He has absolutely no idea how I interpret Romans 9. I don't even know what his brother's name is, but I mean, he could learn it real quick and then try to prove it. Say, hey, I'll prove you wrong and learn it real quick. And I would almost be willing to pay $1,000 for him to just to learn my view. I know I would be willing to pay $1,000 for James White to know my view of John 6 before I get there. Like, like I would literally give him a thousand dollars if he could outline how I would walk through verse 35 through 45, if he could outline it in such a way that was reasonable to suggest what I believe. Cause I honestly, honestly don't think he could. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm overstating my case on that point, but, um, no, I, I it, think, I think you've got good history and examples to, to demonstrate that. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I've got well, I've got video evidence where he, where he actually realizes his mistake in the broadcast, and like goes back and says, "Oh, well, I said that early." No, no, that's not his view, and it's this, and he'll he corrects himself in his live broadcast, realizing what it is that I believe in in time, and so yeah, I, I'm pretty sure uh, that would be a pretty safe bet. What's going on? Making it about, you know, nations and, and Israel and all of this stuff. And even though you hear those tones, you know, represented in the text, when we're talking about Esau mm -hmm. and Jacob, like God is using the example here of two individuals, right? There's two individuals. There's there's Esau and there's Jacob. I, I made this mistake when I was a Calvinist. I I, I kind of heard in passing the, 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 the corporate view of election. And I, I, I remember saying, I remember sitting where I was sitting in a, in a classroom saying this to another guy who brought up nations. Well, that's representing nations. And I said, well, nations are made up of individuals too. I said it just like that. Well, nations are made up of individuals too. And then I said, and then I said, plus Jacob is an individual and Esau is an individual. I said, just like that. I'm, I'm looking back on it. I'm just like cringing about myself at the age of 20. I think I was when I did this, cause I was saying this to this, this guy across the aisle from me was probably, he was probably 26, 27. He was in my, he was older guy that came back to school and I'm saying this to him. And I said, and Pharaoh is an individual too. And, and I remember him kind of going like this. He just kind of closed his eyes and just kind of, and now I understand what he was doing. He was counting to 10 slow, quite like, because he could, I was having to, he was having to deal with a cage stage Calvinist that he was just so sure of himself. He just kind of closes his eyes and he goes, I know that they're, those are individuals, but Jacob represents a nation, the nation of Israel. His name's changed to Israel and Esau represents a nation, the Edomites. Um, and it's true of the individuals too. What he's saying is true of the individuals. We're not saying it's not true of the individuals, but he's making a point about those individuals being chosen for a particular purpose. And we didn't get much into it. We got, get interrupted. The class started or whatever, but. He was, that he's trying to explain to me what I'm explaining now is what our view is. And that Pharaoh, yes, was hardened. Pharaoh was hardened by God to ensure the first Passover. In the same way, Israel, the nation of Israel, is being hardened currently in Romans 9, being hardened in order to ensure the second Passover. That's the point he's making. Now, we're not denying individuals are involved there by any means, okay? Um, there's two nations in your womb, God said. Speaking of the two twins, one of those nations becomes the nation of Israel that carries the promise. The other one's not chosen for that noble purpose, but they're still blessed by God. They're still loved by God. God even says, do not despise the Edomites for they are your brothers. And he tells the Israelites not to go through their land because he has given them that land and they're honoring God and God's blessing them with land and food and nations. 
And it's not until the Edomites become jealous and they attack the Israelites that God declares his hatred and wrath for them in, in Malachi. That's just the facts of the matter, brothers and sisters. And when you understand that context, which his audience, Paul's audience, would have known this information. He didn't have to tell him that, them this information. They actually knew it because they knew their Bibles. And so you're just assuming this is about God choosing one twin before he's born for salvation and the other for damnation before they do anything good or bad, which God decrees the good and the bad they end up doing, by the way. And so this is about reprobation versus election. Esau is reprobated. J Jacob is elected for salvation. You're assuming that's true. And then you read the rest of the text, assuming that presumption upon the text. And we're just telling you, we don't believe that's what Paul's talking about. And we can actually demonstrate for you, looking at the Old Testament passages that he's quoting from, why that's not what he's talking about. And yet so many Calvinists won't even take the time to hear that out and understand that the corporate view of election still is acknowledging that the individuals are involved, but it's talking about them being chosen for a particular service, a purpose, a noble purpose, and recognizing that those who are elect are only elect insofar as they're connected to the elect one. They're under the headship of Christ through faith versus under Adam through sin. So if you choose to sin, if you choose to rebel, you're under the condemnation that's declared over Adam in the fall. If you choose to believe and trust in Christ, the other federal head, then you are elect in the Son. You're elect in Christ. That's the corporate view of election. And, and yet his representation of the corporate view is, oh, it's about that now all that nation stuff, all these nations. Well, these are individuals. And he's not really dealing with the corporate, corporate perspective. Jacob. And starting in verse 11, here's what it says. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Who thought works was the way to earn God's favor? And who thought works were the way to get justified? Israel. He's confronting what Israel thought was the way of being elect and for the reason for them being elected. And what he's explaining is that, that that's not the purpose that I elected Israel. It's not about, and the reason I know this is what Paul is talking about is because Paul tells us in his own commentary in verses 30 and following, when he says, what shall we say to these things? In other words, here's my commentary on what I just explained, that the Jews, they have pursued, they have worked for justification through the law, and they've not attained it. But the Gentiles, the barbarians, the nations of the world that are out there, not following God's laws, not following the Levitical law, the cleansing laws, all those laws, they're not following those things. But they're attaining righteousness. Why? Because they're pursuing it. Notice they're pursuing it. Oh, that's work salvation, plagianism. They're pursuing it through faith, and therefore they're attaining it. So in the mind of Paul, what's, he, what's the dichotomy in Paul's mind? Monergism versus synergism two theologically made up words by Calvinist? No. Faith versus works. That's what he's con that that's the dichotomy in Paul's mind throughout this chapter. God can establish covenant with whomever he pleases. And if he wants to establish covenant with those barbarian Gentiles who did not work but who had faith, then he has every right to do so and who are you to talk back to God if he chooses to harden you after patiently holding out his hands to you, if he chooses to fit you for destruction and show mercy and grace to those who believe through faith, then who are you to question God? That's the story throughout 9 through 11. Not this monergism versus synergism, uh, determinism versus libertarianism or, or in, you know, indeterminism or any of these kinds of, you know, discussions and debates that aren't even introduced for another three or 400 years into the church. Um, uh, and, and w I just wish that these guys would allow someone like you or me to come on their program and at least express our positions in their audience's hearing, because I, I'm almost certain that a good percentage of their audience, I don't know how much percentage, but a good percentage of their audience who were not hardcore into their Calvinism 
as he even acknowledges in our last episode, I don't know if you got to see that, but in the first portion of this, he acknowledges the number of donors and people who support his ministry who are not Calvinists. And so if he had someone like myself on who's reasonable, respectful to them, who can come on and just explain how we understand this, I think he would lose a large number of those who support him, not financially, maybe they'd still maybe support him for all the things that he does, but they would lose he would lose a lot of people who are still on that edge about the Calvinism thing because they would be seeing how reasonable our interpretation actually is in light of the whole of scripture. Yeah, I mean, um, you've got you've got a lot of people watching, and they're going, "Well, these guys are Calvinists, but they believe God just allows evil, and um, they He's giving people what they deserve." You know, so you got a lot of people that are hearing them use language that isn't actually appropriate for their system, and going, well, "That's just Christianity." Right. I'm going to support these guys. I, I hear things about Calvinism, but it's not that bad. And um, yeah. and I think I think if if you actually came on there and you're like, "Well, let's give you some pushback," what is God permitting in your system, if not His own decree? You know, and and I think when you're going to wake up a lot of people when they hear that. Well, I I, I don't just think that that would be what ha would happen. I, I'm I'm actually certain of it based upon what's already happening. Um, I'm already getting a lot of people from James White's program coming here and saying, you know, I listened to James White for this reason or that reason. I followed Apologia about this or that, and I heard about you because they're always confronting you. And you, you make much more sense on this issue than they do. And so that's why I'm, I'm here now. Um, that happens all the time. I mean, and so it's not just like a fluke, you know, reaction. I get this kind of thing on a regular basis. And, and if you had one or two or three or four, you know, one thing, but I get that many in a month that are, that are saying they're coming over here from, from hearing from James White and stu uh, apology studios and those kinds of things. So I know if they gave me the platform on their page, I know that that number would, would multiply. And that's, um, that's one of the, probably one why. of the reasons I'm doing the debate. I, I, I want the opportunity to debate because I got a lot of people from the first debate uh, to, to come over. Um, and and I'm, I'm looking forward to that flood <laughs> coming, for coming from the second debate as well, because it, it, I think it's inevitable. Yeah, I was going to say, that's probably why there's some reluctance to come on your program as well, because of that tendency to, to have that kind of impact. But I am, I was going to say, I am glad that they, you know, that, that White did agree to debate you because it'll still have that same impact. You know, White's a, White's a pretty smart dude. He's a, he's no, uh, uh, no, um, what is the word I'm looking for here? Slouch. Um, slouch. Yeah. He's no slouch when it comes to debates. He knows what he's doing. He knows how to formulate and work the garden path. He knows how to probe for weaknesses. He's a very strategic, uh, strategic guy. You know I mean? He earned the gray, you know? Um, but, uh, I, I think, I think you're going to, I think you're going to do well. I think you're going to take it to him. And I, I look forward to doing a debate review on that. Hopefully I can attend. That would be, yeah. that would be a dream come true. Cause I told you what my dream is. I want to, I want to get James White autographing a copy of your book. And I want to get That's right. you autographing a copy of James White's book. And I want to frame them and hang them up on the wall together. Yeah. <laughs> there, see, there's another example of it. Jude, Jordan Lawrence, so they went to Jeff's church, but yet they're here. Um, and I get, I get those kind of messages. There's two or three more in the side. I get those kind of messages all the time. And so it's not, I, you know, we're coming up on two hours here and I've actually got some other plans this evening. Um, so but am I going to run the show for the next four hours? Yeah, I, I could just let it roll here and take off if you want me to. Um, they get here to, they, they mentioned again at the end. And so let me, let me just pass fast forward and see if reprobate. they, God doesn't call us to do that. I'm like, who are the reprobate? Uh, I didn't know that we we yeah. go out and look at a, a crowd of people and go oh, here it is, place actually. for every single sin they've ever committed, including their unbelief. If the Holy Spirit of God can try to save and draw people and just fail, my question to you is this: Why are you doing evangelism? God's already put. So he's at, he's basically reversing the answer is okay. If determinism is true, why are we doing evangelism? Which is the natural response everybody has when they first are introduced into Calvinism. Everybody asks that question: Well, why are we evangelizing them? And so instead of answering that question, he just turns it around and he says if you don't believe in determinism, in other words, if you don't believe, if you believe God's the kind of God that fails, um, trying to save people and can't, then why are you doing evangelism? And which I think is an absurd question because I'm doing evangelism because I'm trying to persuade just like Paul was when he spends all day long trying to persuade them of who Jesus is. So I'm trying to persuade the will, provoke the will um, of free creatures. That's why I'm doing evangelism. I'm trying to persuade them to the truth because I want them to experience God in the way that I have. It's an easy answer, just like that. No problem. 
There's no quandary, no philosophical back and forth. Just real simple. I'm trying to persuade people of the truth because I want them to experience God the way I have, period. That's your, there's your answer. What's your answer now, Jeff? Because you didn't give one. Um, you asked the question, you posed the question, if determinism is true, i.e. if Calvinism is true, why evangelize? And he, he doesn't answer. He just says, well, let me reverse that and say, if you believe God fails, then why are you evangelizing? Well, one, I'm not believing God's failing because God's not trying to effectually save people and failing because we don't believe God's trying to effectually save people. God's making an offer. He's making an appeal. He's calling people in love to repent and believe. And he wants for true love to take place, which as C.S. Lewis argues, for true love worth having, it must be free. Otherwise, it's just automatons and robots and it's not real love. And so that that's why we're doing what we're doing. You want to add to that, Warren? No, I mean, it, it's... it's um... It, it's a good rhetorical response. I mean, you want to reframe the objection and you want to try and use it to show that your your opposition has or your opponent's position has some sort of, you know, logical problem with that same issue. You'll see this when the problem of evil and things are raised. Um, and they'll try and say, well, because you believe God permits it while well, he's graciously calling people to repent so he can redeem it, that's just as bad as him eternally effectuating it, right? Now, what I just did was reframe it without answering the question. So before I uh, not answer the question and get accused of doing that intentionally, I don't think that when we're giving the gospel that we're failing. The Bible says some, pl some plant, some water, some reap. Right. And those that reject it are doing so under bringing more condemnation upon themselves. So when you understand the purpose of what we're doing, um, it never fails. It never goes back void. Uh, it, it's not, it's not doing that, but that doesn't negate the fact that, that men are not, um, eternally exhaustively effectually, uh, faded agents where everything has been eternally decreed and will obtain necessarily. Um, you know, we're, we're evangelizing, we're showing love, we're showing relation, we're interacting with others in the same way God interacted with us in the person of the incarnate Christ. Um, he's a relational God. He's a loving God. He's a God who says, come, let us reason together. And then he sends Paul and, and um, was it Barnabas? Uh, and and they, they argue so effectively, they speak so effectively that a great number believed. But one of the things that I've seen and I'm not saying Jeff does this. I, I see him do street uh, uh, preaching and things, and so I don't believe he's guilty of this. But they'll come in and they'll say, we don't even need to have strong arguments because it's been decreed. You know, we just go through the motions. And, you know, if you don't convince that person, it's because they just weren't eternally ordained to respond at that time. Who knows? Maybe later they'll respond. We're going to go along. And, um, and I think that there's a risk with that sort of view of, uh, of just phoning it in. And, um, you know, you see this within the, the criticisms historically of Calvinism, where they're like, like with the, contrasting the Anabaptists against the Reformed uh, Calvinists, they go, what is it about these Anabaptists over here where they, they're living lives of transformed, you know, uh, they, they're showing the fruit of the spirit. Why can't we get our people to do this? You know, this is a, a historical criticism that is constantly raised. Um, and, and, and hopefully, each generation, those that concern that are concerned about truth, that care about these things, um, will commit their ways to pursuing Christ and praying to the Father and asking for Him to reveal them uh, the truth and being good stewards and being responsible with their God-given faculties and and reasoning uh, because we our position believes you can reason. You weren't fated to go through some sort of machinery input-output process of doing what God eternally decreed, and we think you can actually reason. Scripture even says the, uh, the the unbelieving Gentiles, you know. So, uh, so I, I I take major issue with this idea that um, on our end it's it's not effective. It is effective. It's yeah. just not it's not um, effective in the same sense that the Calvinist is question begging. Well, and it's not and it's not because it's not you necessarily you failing or God failing. It's the person rejecting. So we're putting in other words what what's happening? We're putting the blame on the sinner, yep, not on the deliverer of the message or on God. The Calvinist is putting it onto God, saying ultimately God decrees his rejection, and he couldn't have done otherwise. And we're saying, no, don't give him that excuse. He he could have. He's not he's not rejecting a God who first rejected him. He's rejecting a God who loves and provides for him. And so, he, matter of fact, on Calvinism, he doesn't have anything to reject. Uh, a reprobate doesn't have anything to reject because Jesus didn't die for the the uh, reprobate on Calvinism. So he's not rejecting any provision. He has no provision to reject. 
he's rejecting, ultimately he's rejecting a God who hates him and created him for destruction. And, and that's a much less blameworthy person in my estimation than one who rejects a God who loves and provides for them. And so that, that's why we make this case. Um, one of the, excuse me, one of the Calvinists in the side chat says, well, we, we evangelize. Why? Because God told us to. So law is what's driving your evangelism, not love. Um, in other words, if you're evangelizing because you are told to, nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's obedience. But if you're only obeying because of law, instead of the love for the person, like Paul had in, in Romans 9, 1 through 3, that he'd give up his own salvation for the, 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 these hardened Israelites that have been cut off because of their rebellion, because of their unbelief. As Romans 11 explains, they were cut off not arbitrarily, they were cut off for their unbelief. And so Paul is expressing his love and longing for them and, and God's longing to hold out his hands to them all day long, longing to gather them. That love and that longing is what drives his motivation to spend all day long in Acts 28, for example, all day long trying to persuade them of the truthfulness of Jesus. Some are convinced and some would ref refuse to believe. That's their fault for refusing to believe. They traded the truth in for lies. It takes work to trade the truth in for lies. It takes work to suppress something. Suppress means to hold something down. So I do believe in works damnation. You have to work damn hard to be damned. You have to work damn hard to explain away the truth of God's revelation through light creation, the gospel. And so I do believe in works damnation. You, you have to work to be damned. Mm -hmm. But you don't work to be saved. Why? Because what, what are you doing? You're accepting that which is true. You're ceasing work and trusting in the work of another. To cease work and trust in the work of another is not a work that earns your salvation. And, and be, being accused of believing that because you're ceasing work and trusting in the work of another that you're working to earn your salvation is absurd on its face. And so um, just, just keep that in mind. Let me let me uh, go through a few of these starred before we do this yeah, last I was gonna say, there, there was some, some super chats in here that I, I actually have a video that I could just direct them to watch if they want to know my position on it. Um, let's see. Let me make sure I get these. Uh, Mr. Midnight, uh, sorry for the, oh, I got that one already. Um, okay, K, the elder, uh, per Romans 9, Jews assumed their election was to the exclusion of the Gentiles. Seems Calvinists used Romans 9 to make the same exclusion mistake. Exactly, yeah, exactly. The same mistake that the Pharisees were making is the same one in some sense, in a different sense, that the, that the Calvinist is making. You're exactly right. Um, Mary Lewis, thank you for your super super sticker there. Uh, solitary Emmy, a crazy question. Calvinism seems to make God like a different God. How come they can say they have the same gospel if the character is so different? Um, we, we've answered that so many different times. Uh, solitary Emmy, I mean, I, I don't know how many times we have to answer that question. Um, we, we can believe that someone has a genuine knowledge of the God of Scripture and believes philosophically bad things or wrong things about them, just like uh, Peter. Peter believed that the gospel was only for the Jews until he had the dream with the white sheet let down and was called to go. I mean, most of us today, if if we if there was anybody out there saying Gentiles can't be saved, we would we would probably all be calling them a heretic and saying they're not really saved because they had a false view of the what the true gospel is. And so there's zeal without knowledge. In other words, Peter had zeal. He had true knowledge, I mean, true understanding of believing in Jesus, but he had the wrong view of the gospel. Peter had, I mean, Paul, before his conversion on the road to Damascus, had zeal, but without knowledge. God had to correct him, put his zeal in the right place because he needed to be corrected. Um, and so there are people who have the wrong knowledge or the wrong understanding or wrong interpretation, like I did for 10 years. But I, I don't think I lost my salvation during the 10 years that I adopted Calvinism. And so, again, I I understand that 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 question of the quandary because the, the, the Calvinism logical implications if they're truly played out does seem so far from what the true revelation of scripture is. I understand why people have that conclusion, but it's the same thing that Calvinists often say about Arminians. R.C. Sproul talks about this cognitive dissonance that Arminians, you know, have, and therefore they're saved, but barely. And and then, so if, if nothing else, we could, we could say the same thing to a certain degree. And I would never say barely because either you're saved or you're not. Um, but I would say that there's a cognitive dissonance between what, what Calvinists are trying to claim versus what their implications of their system actually are. And if, if um, I could speak yeah, to that ahead. real quick too, because yeah, sure. we're, we're in the West and we have this kind of particular Western mindset where you have to assent to a specific 
set of propositions. And then if you assent to that, then you get, you know, the, your test or your Scantron, if you're as old as myself and maybe late in here, you get your Scantron checked and you pass, right? And so, hey, okay, there you go. I've assented to the right number or right amount or the right specific propositions and therefore I'm saved. And I think scripture is pretty clear here that, that sometimes God will overlook ignorance, but he judges the, the intent and the character of the heart. And so I know when I was a Calvinist, I love Jesus. I just had some really bad ideas about him. And so I think it's dangerous if we take certain propositions and use those as a litmus test, because what you end up with is condemning every young convert to Christianity, because no one comes to the faith with all of the perfect propositional knowledge. They come with a heart going, I don't know. All I know is that I need him. And, and Jesus, I believe, says that's enough. And so we can have some really bad ideas about him, and the, the Spirit will lead us into truth, and over time we'll see we're delivered out of that. But I think it's really dangerous when we come in and we just make it a litmus test. Now, I will say, if you've ever encountered anyone in any theological camp uh, for a long period of time, you're going to find people that just don't exemplify any real fruit of the Spirit. And so you can make individual judgments about a particular individual that is you know, maybe running around cheating on his wife and lying, stealing and, and living ungodly. And I mean, they're, they're, we are called to be discerners in that regard, but we've got to be careful to nuance that over entire systems based on some sort of propositional set. I, I think that's just really dangerous. Right. Yeah, well said. Uh, Alien from Area 21. Uh, Leighton, can you please explain what happens to those who never hear the gospel in your system? Let me uh, promote this book to you, God's Provision for All. Actually, a couple chapters that cover that question. It's also free online. If you Google that question uh, at Soteriology 101 or on this YouTube page, you'll get it because I have several videos answering that question. One, I, I don't believe there is anyone who hasn't heard the, the news of God um, to a, to a su sufficient degree for them to respond to it. Now, a lot of people, when they hear the word gospel, they think, oh, that means the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from Nazareth and all of the details involved with it. And that's not what I'm referring to. I mean, the good news that God exists and that he is love, that he He has a provision for you. I think God does make that known in, in a sufficient way. Um, and, and thus, anyone who responds to the light and the revelation they've been given, general revelation through whatever means that he reveals himself, law written on your heart, the conscience that either defends or accuses you in, in Romans 2, all of those are revelations of God. And if you are faithful with the little amount of light that he gives you, he is faithful to bring more light, more revelation to those who would receive it. And, and if you're, you're going to reject his light, the revelation, the little amount of light, then he may take that away from you. He can harden you in your rebellion, give you over to your defiled heart and mind if that's what he chooses to do. He, he doesn't owe you any more revelation, any more light. Um, and so that that's what the scriptures seem to to indicate to me. Um, yeah, and, and I was going to say go I've, I've got a video we did just a few weeks ago with the Bible Brodown guys on this topic. Oh, they're they're great um, on that topic on Christian universal on universal witness. Yeah, and and we're not we're not uh, I don't think I don't want to speak for Layton, but I I think we're on the same page here. Um, we're not we're not promoting like a plurality or universalism where all roads lead to God. What we're saying is we believe that God has given sufficient revelation of Himself so as to bring. Uh, people n sufficient knowledge and then judges them based on that. But in all cases, people are saved through the work of Christ, through what he's accomplished, right. uh, and that he's the one that determines who's in and out of the kingdom, not us. And it's not even just a, a sent to a certain proposition, but he, he looks at the heart. Um, but if yeah. you're really interested in this, you can check out that video. It's in big, bold letters, universalism versus Christian inclusivism. Um, and, and you can get two hours or so worth of, uh, defense of, of my position contrasted against like a universalist position. Well, well said. All right. Alien from area 21 also says, are you, you are good at explaining the problems with Calvinism, but what about your system? Again, let me uh, promote this book. This is, does, doesn't mention Calvinism in the bulk of the book. It's a defense of uh, God's provision for all people. Um, but I also have uh, many videos out there where I've talked through provisionism. If you look up the word provisionism, what is provisionism? I'll walk through the provide acrostic and give verses that, that do that. Um, since you reject original sin, well, I, I, I wouldn't say I just reject original sin because I do believe there was an original sin. Um, and I hold to a differing view of original sin than, than was first promoted by Augustine. 
um, as have many reformers. In fact, uh, Zwingli and Luther had a debate or debated over this issue, and Luther called Zwingli a Pelagian because he did not believe in inherited guilt, as we read from uh, Adam Harwood's book uh, in, a, in a previous episode. So just to say you reject original sin is not really accurate because I do hold to a maybe a differing view of original sin than the typical Calvinist would hold to. Um, so if those who never hear the gospel end up in hell because of their sin, is God unjust? And again, that, that's already been, I think, answered. Okay, chaos in order. Thank you for your super chat. Romans 9.15 quotes Exodus 33.19 and was referencing Jews. If you go back to verse 12, using the Calvinistic exegetical logic, that means only Jews will be shown mercy, which is wrong. Calvinism can't self-apply its standards. And I tried to point that out, that very point out in the debate. Um, and this is when he accuses me, quote unquote, of running off to the other text, meaning I'm going to the text that Paul is quoting from in the Old Testament to look at the context to demonstrate how in that context, Paul's application would fall apart on itself. And that's that I'm accused. You're running off to other texts and that's not good exegesis. And that was the entire defense of James White in that debate is my opponent didn't exegete the text. What he means by that is he didn't exegete it the way I did, which is just question begging. Of course, I didn't exegete it the way you do. That's why we're having a debate, for goodness sake. I have every right to question your presuppositions coming into this chapter, and I have every right to question uh, the, how you interpret the, the, the text that Paul is quoting from uh, by looking at the text he's quoting from in its uh, original context. And that's not running off to the other text. It's called, that's called uh, uh, looking at corroborating text and looking at the text that he's uh, quoting from. There's nothing... Nothing wrong with that. That's what you're supposed to do. Yeah, you don't exegete in isolation, as Ben says. Uh, scripture interprets Scripture. I even quote from R.C. Sproul saying, allow Scripture to interpret Scripture, uh, because that that has to happen. James White is joining us. I see him. Oh, darn. I thought it was James. Dang. It's going to finally get James White on the program. But it's you. You're sharing a screen. Yeah, it's about, about a few. Uh, it, somebody in the side chat just said uh, about eight minutes or so ago, he released a video on provisionist rhetoric. So I was just going to say that uh, everybody should go over there and comment on his video, how much uh, you agree or just, Oh wait, you can't comment on his comment. videos. Uh, oh, you yeah, can't comment on his videos. Out, maybe, oh. maybe we might need to meet for part two uh, after we review that. Well, give me something to listen to on my run tomorrow or walk. I don't run. I have to be honest. I walk kind of fast, but not I crawl very fast. I crawl. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still on those babies. Something to listen to. That's something to listen to next time I go on my, my, I, I meant to, um, I meant to finish this, uh, because he said he does bring me up one more time. And so I thought, let, let me just finish to this. Put forth his best effort. He can be thwarted by the creature. Why do you even pray for, um, God to, to intervene in someone's life in terms of evangelism and salvation? Why even pray? Um, why would I ask my dad to help me with anything? If I don't believe my dad determines everything that happens in my life. Because he's wiser than me, because he has more influence than in me, because he knows more than I do, because he can do things that I can't accomplish because he's my dad. So the same thing could be true of the father in heaven. God knows more than I do. He's wiser than me. He can give me comfort, guidance, direction. That's why I pray. Why would you pray if determinism is true? Because God determined you to. And so when you don't pray, why don't you pray? Because God determined you not to pray. Again, the, 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 deterministic has logic and philosophy is a much bigger problem with why we pray than, than the free will advocate does. And that, that, by the way, I really highly recommend, um, Ronnie Rogers book on the Calvinism's problem with prayer. Uh, I have an interview with him about that. If you typed in Ronnie Rogers name and sociology 101, it would come up as, uh, the, the issue of pray, praying from our worldview versus praying from their worldview and the distinctions between those two, two, two perspectives. You want to comment on that, Warren? No, I was just going to say that the Calvinist has a real issue with a relational God. Generally speaking, most Calvinists really struggle with this concept. They find a non-relational, eternally static uh, decreer of all things that has more explanatory power than he does actual potency. They find that very reassuring. And, and there's reasons for that. I'm not going to discredit that. If you think everything has already been faded, then you can kind of just float down the river and just go with the current. But they have a they have a, a general issue with an idea of a relational God, and uh, and I think prayer is counterintuitive to that. Often you'll hear them say, "Well, we don't pray to tell God about our day, but we 
pray to bring our will in alignment with his. And there's a valid point to that as well, but that's not all there is there. God is relational. And, um, and I think they really, they really struggle to, to understand that and properly yeah. engage with it. So like, let's say, let's say I'm praying for, let's say I'm praying for, for, um, um, Jeff Durbin right now. Right. And I'm like, dear Lord, uh, I'm going to pray for Jeff. I'm not praying that God come in and through some effectual work of changing his ontology enables him such, I'm going to pray that God sends Jeff reasonable people who, who love the Lord, who can show him the fruit of the spirit, who can speak truth to him in a way in which he'll understand it. I'm going to pray that God will be patient with Jeff and give him more time uh, so that he can process this. I'm going to pray that God use natural revelation, perhaps dreams, other things to act upon Jeff and give him more opportunity to respond. But ultimately, I believe Jeff is a free agent and is, will be culpable whether or not he responds or not. And then there are times where we can make a misstep out of ignorance or, or innocent mis misunderstandings. And I know that God will overlook that and he'll take that into account. So when I'm praying for Jeff, I'm not praying that God will come in and do some effectual work to just change him. And I'm, I'm yeah, God, it, God change what you decreed. Thing. Yeah. God change whatever you decreed or God, um, decree, uh, Jeff to be different. Um, you know, or God effectually changed Jeff to be a provisionist. I mean, we don't believe God works that way. We yeah. would say we, again, like you said, I, well, well, well said. All right. God's done everything he can. Uh, Jesus died for all their sins, paid for them in full. And the Holy spirit of God can try and fail, uh, to apply that salvation. So actually I would argue it is only with this biblical perspective that you can have full confidence as you go out and preach the gospel that every single time you go out to preach the gospel, God's purposes are standing. His purposes are completely standing. God is not thwarted by anybody. And you can go out with full confidence that I know God has elect out there. I don't know who they are. I don't know who the rebel they are. Yeah. What was that? Oh, I, that was the one of the, that was Luke. That was uh, one of the guys in the, in the video. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, thought, yeah. I thought it was you jumping in. Okay. No. There we go. No. Contrary to even some mis, uh, characterizations and just outright just ignorance of someone like even like Leighton Flowers uh, in terms of Christians and the, and the reprobate, uh, like abandon. He said in one of his last videos I, I seen on this, something about abandoning Christians, abandoning the reprobate. God doesn't call us to do that. I'm like, who are the reprobate? Uh, I didn't know that we we yeah. go out and look at a, a crowd of people and go, no, I'm sorry, bro. You're reprobate. You're not getting the gospel. Well, and if me. you are, Paul says something about that. Yeah. I don't remember ever saying Christians abandoning reprobates. So I'm not sure if he'd actually play my video in its context, then maybe we would know. But these guys don't do that. Him and Dr. White don't usually play my stuff in context. They'll quote me out of context or not even quote me at all. Um, maybe what I was talking about is that some people on the Calvinistic side forget the, the reprobate side of things. They only want to talk about the elect side of things. I could see myself saying something like that because that's even Austin Fisher's. Uh, remember, remember the guy that wrote the Restless No Longer Reformed uh a book and he talks about how he just continued in the back of his mind hearing the reprobate crying out to him saying what about the reprobate what does god do to them how is that called love you you say god loves everybody but and and even john macarthur defends the love of god for everybody but how what kind of love is this is david hunt's book asking you know, what is that love can you call that love what he's doing to the reprobate and so i may have made some comment about how christians ignore the reprobate on Calvinism because it's too difficult to deal with that subject. That's a dreadful decree as even Calvin put it. And so it may have been in that context, but it wasn't in the context of us saying that we thought Calvinists knew who the reprobate were and who aren't. No, no, we, we don't, we, I, I know Calvinists don't think they know who the elect are and who the reprobate are. I know they, they preach indiscriminately to all people because they don't know who the elect are. I've said that many times. I have it in articles correcting people who say that Calvinists um, are necessarily unevangelistic. I told them how I was evangelistic and even on the mission field when I was a Calvinist and defend Calvinists against that accusation all the time. So um, again, just another example of a brother misrepresenting another brother on a live broadcast with thousands of people watching and listening to him. And and we're, people need to hold people, other Christians accountable for that kind of thing and say, that's not what I said, brother. P play my stuff for like I'm doing for you. I'm playing you in your actual words in the context of your thing. I'm putting link on the sh in the in the show notes to people go watch the whole thing and see it for themselves. And you're not doing that for us. Um, you didn't put a link in your show notes to the video where I said whatever you just accused me of saying. Um, you just quoted it out of context and and 
in a way that I would have never said it and then make your case, uh, accusing me of being ignorant. Um, and so that, that's not the way you critique a brother in my estimation. Um, he, he seems to be following the, the path of his mentor, James White, in that regard, because unfortunately, James White does that kind of thing too, unfortunately. Um, and I suspect, if I'm, if I'm guessing right, Warren, that the, um, the broadcast where he's talking about provisionist rhetoric, it's going to be about that tweet that we, are, we mentioned earlier in the program. It's going to be about how he's going to he's going to use semantic arguments about how we don't believe Calvin is speaking. We don't believe that men are made into better people in order to believe the gospel, and 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 then he'll go on describing how they're better people in a way that doesn't use the word better. So, uh, and that'll be an interesting one to play. I'm, I'm well, looking forward. I'll be to, listening to, to it. It'll, I'll be listening. I'll have James White. Uh, uh, put me to bed tonight. I'll, I'll be laying there with my chamomile tea and my Jamie jams on and the sheets pulled up tight and the dulcet tones of James White lulling me to, to sleep as, uh, as he, he's, he's upset at you and your, your provisionistic rhetoric. I'll be having sweet dreams of, uh, James White I jumping can't. over this way and you jumping <laughs> over that way, both singing, uh, in, in, in beautiful harmony. So, uh, oh, that's I, I will, I will be listening to that stuff. later. I, I want to see what his, his take is on that. Yeah. And that, um, I can't, I definitely can't listen to the white going to bed because it'll get me, it'll get me thinking about too many things I want to say in response. I, that's why I have to listen to him while I'm exercising because it just make me walk faster. Right? <laughs> it's just, all right, right. Okay. Keep Gets me going. The blood pressure going, huh? Yeah. 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 It keeps me, it keeps me moving. Um, one, one last super chat before we got to bring this to a close. Um, uh, Patmos Isle. Um, consistent Calvinist interpretation, Esau I hated before he did anything bad. Uh, Esau is undeserving of God's hate, according to Calvinism. He's not responsible. Yeah, that's that's the problem with their system. Now, you'll have Sproul, I've played, I've, 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 and what do I do? I got Sproul's book on Romans 9, his quote-unquote commentary on Romans 9. I put it up on the screen, and I read through it, and then answered. So I let them speak for themselves, represent themselves, and basically... He doesn't put it in this word, but basically he argues that God in view of what Esau becomes. And so the way you might characterize that is looking through the quarters of time. Now, Sproul would never say looking through the quarters of time because that's a caricature. It's a caricature for both views, by the way, but you'll see that language all the time. So God looks through the quarters of time. In other words, he foresees or knows in the future that Esau will be a bad person and therefore, on the basis of what he knows Esau will become, he's reprobating him justly based upon that knowledge. But then why does he say it's before he did anything bad? Just like before he did anything good, he's electing him for salvation. The reason he's saying before he did anything good on the Calvinistic interpretation of that is because it's unconditional of his good that he does, including having faith. Therefore, it has to be before he does anything good. So why wouldn't that be consistent with before he did anything bad with Esau? Calvinist, this is this is this reveals the fault line of the whole Calvinistic system is that you've got God condemning. And if if Esau represents the reprobate, this is most of humanity. So most unborn babies are hated salvifically and reprobated by God before they've done anything bad. And what's even worse about that is that on the Calvinistic system, consistently applied, which a lot of Calvinists don't do, but consistently applied, would be that God decreed the very bad things they end up doing. And they could not have done otherwise because of the nature that God decreed them to be born with. Thus, they don't have any genuine control over the way in which they respond to the gospel or any revelation of God for that matter. All right. I think we have brought that to a close, at least as far as I want to go tonight. And, um, and I will just thank you, Warren, for jumping on this right. last minute and joining in with the discussion. And I uh, appreciate those who have uh, joined the broadcast and have listened, the, the super chats, the questions that you've asked. That makes this program so much more fun. And we appreciate those who j jump on and, and enter, enter, uh, give interchange on the side chat, the engagement with the, 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 I like that. I think that's part of the theology geeking. It's how we learn from each other. Uh, hopefully we do so representing each other well 
Warren, any last word from you? Thing, anything you want to promote? If you haven't, if you haven't subscribed to Idol Killer, you should go do so. Anything else uh, you would like to tell the audience before we part ways? Yeah, uh, yeah, just go check out Idol Killer over on YouTube. Um, you know, we do a good mix of deep theological and philosophical historical studies. We look at various doctrines. Um, we do AI and parody and uh, and fun stuff. But coming up tomorrow, hilarious. Got, they're hilarious. I, I I try some of them. Some of them land a little flat, but I'm, I think they're getting better. I've got one in the works right now. Ooh, can't wait to show you guys. But um, uh, I've got Dr. Ryan Mullins and Dr. Alan Rhoda coming on tomorrow to respond to Dr. Gavin Ortland on Divine Simplicity. That'll be a cool video. I ask everybody to go hit that remind bell so you can check that out tomorrow. Um, I was asked to go live after this, but no, I'm going to go get dinner and, and go to sleep. I'm an old man and I get cranky if I don't get my food and my beauty rest. I mean, I, I saw in this comment, in, in, in this live stream, no less than five people talking about my glorious hair. And I just want to say it takes a lot of sleep to maintain this. I mean, that's I've got a standard to keep people. So, uh, but no, I'm not going to be going live. But just if you're interested in my stuff, go check out Idol Killer. <laughs> Layton, thank you for having me on, sir. It was a pleasure. I'm going to uh, seriously go listen to uh, James White and see if there's anything worth responding to there. God bless you guys. Go now, share Christ and show love. Bye-bye.